Hey, everybody. So uh, I'm recording this intro back in my usual spot in my apartment in Lincoln Park. Um, you can see I got a new poster to replace the one that fell. My girlfriend got it for, for me for Christmas. It's a top 100 movies watch list scratch board. So when you can, you can take like a coin in and every movie that you've seen or you see after you get the poster, you scratch the, the, the gold plated version of it off and it reveals a colored version. You can actually see it. I did it with the Apocalypse Now one, but I'll probably show that uh, again, uh, a little more in depth in a later video. So uh, the last episode was actually still recorded at my parents' house, um, but uh, it's a really great episode. Nonetheless, uh, it is uh, with actor Stephen George. I'm very excited for you all to see it. Um, Steven is an actor who I've worked with before. He uh, just, he worked on a series. He didn't just work on a series, but he, he worked on this very amazing comedy web series called Co-Switched. So we talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about his acting experience, his experience as a comedic actor and working as a professional Chicago actor, doing commercials, doing movies, uh, web series and all that. He's very funny. A uh, very talented guy, uh, and it's just a, you know a ball to talk to him. So I can't wait for you all to see it. As always, if you like this video, if you like this episode, please subscribe uh, to the channel. It would mean a lot to me. And if you want to follow the podcast on Instagram, you can follow at Podcast Career Thirteen. Also, be on the lookout for uh, the Career Thirteen podcast coming up on Spotify pretty soon. Uh, I will have a more concrete date for you later down the line when that all comes out. Uh, I just still need to do it. I apologize for the delay. But uh, without further ado, let's start the show. This is the Courier 13 podcast with Winter Andrews, a weekly think tank of in-depth conversations among rising filmmakers. My goal with the show is to showcase the innovative talent and ideas that Hollywood hasn't discovered yet. We're recording. We're All right, sweet. Good deal, man. Hey, man, what's up? I'm good, dude. Uh, I like. I'm. I'm digging the uh, the lighting of your room. It's. Uh, Thank you. You can Thank tell you. you're a filmmaker. You've got perfect lighting on your face, and the background's not busy. Oh well, you know I, mean? I I appreciate that. Uh, it's been. I haven't. I, this is the first time. Actually, this is the first episode that I've had a microphone that I'm. Oh that yeah, I, I see that, that I'm using a lighting kit. So this is like we've been. Where this is the. 14th episode and we finally gotten like professional so i'm go. really i'm really uh, proud of that let me see your lighting kit can you uh can you show me yeah with we your, can uh, we can we can break the magic we can just like it. yep it's oh, right there yeah. that's what i'm talking dude so many people have ring lights nowadays and they always put it directly in front of their face and it's the most distracting thing ever because they just have like two freaking halos in their eyes and it's so distracting yeah yeah sometimes you'll see that's that on, like on uh, I don't know. For whatever reason, when I was younger, I used to watch like acapella videos, oh, and yeah? like, and and there would always be one where like, it's the solo, and you got like a, a close up on one solo guy, and they got the ring lights, and you're like, why is there two <laughs> white circles in his eyes? This doesn't make <laughs> this feels this feels weird. I don't, I don't understand it. Wait, I didn't know they had uh, ring lights for that long. I figured that was like something that came with the advent of social media. I didn't realize. Well, yeah, I guess around. what I mean by like when I was young, this might have been. This like... was last month. <laughs> and you're just saying it when you were young? Yeah, yeah. It was like maybe five, six years ago. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. I get it. I mean, I used to watch Disney Channel till I was like 17. And I would say, yeah, when I was, when I was young, when I was 10 years old. Yeah. You're, you're a fan? You're a fan of their content? Oh, like Disney now? Channel? Yeah. Now I have no idea what's going on. All I know <laughs> is that dude, Jake Paul... Who used to didn't he used to be like a former Disney Channel fan? And yes. Now he's, now he's just calling every top-rated MMA fighter out in the universe. So that's how I know about Disney Channel. Disney Channel for me was that's a Raven, Hannah oh, Montana, yeah. uh, Corey in the house. Those <sighs> shows. Zach and Cody. Those are my those are my shows. Yeah. 
I, I know they always say that like with every generation, they always look at the generation that comes after them as like, like they have crappier stuff. Like there's always like back in my day, my stuff was better. But I do think that children's programming was better. Way back better. When, way better back when I was when I was younger, when we were younger, like that was like that's so raven. Like it felt like they were actually trying. Now now they're just like it's just a laugh track. And pretty yeah, pretty going much. through the motions. Yeah. It's not even funny. Yeah, like like a lot of these old school cartoons that our parents used to watch, like apparently Tom and Jerry just completely dominated for decades. I'm sure. And, uh, and that still stands up real well. I'd rather watch Tom and Jerry than whatever. I don't even know what's on the Disney Channel lineup nowadays. I'm kind of kind of scared to look it up. It, it, it is scary. My my sister, she watched that for a while. And like not the good stuff, like the bad stuff. Like, oh, no. And I don't want to name names because there are people who work on these shows. But, sure, yeah, yeah. But uh, I again, laugh tracks. And I think what you were saying with Tom and Jerry, the reason why Tom and Jerry still holds up is because it's all based on what the characters do, like their actions. Like there's no talking. Mm -hmm. It's just the situation itself. And, this, and the, the funny situation is always funnier than the dumb or, or like throwaway quip that you have. Not saying that those can't be funny. Like obviously I love comedies that have really funny dialogue. Like that can be really funny, but yeah. it's because it's also funny because of the situation that's happening and what's going on with the characters yeah and i think yeah the, probably the biggest reason why they've been the number one cartoon for like 40 years is because of the lack of dialogue like last time i my i don't speak my parents native tongue which is okay. uh the language malayalam okay but, uh, when i where's, went to in, where's I, that from it's from uh, it's from south india okay park park or kerala and apparently millions of people i mean india has just just has way too many languages it's insane why but, is like, that it's uh i mean for one thing we just have so many people i mean right now they have this whole like farmer protest which is going on over there where basically they have like almost 300 million people protesting which is basically this the entire population of the u.s it's just i guess when you just have so many people you're just bound to have different languages i don't know right well it's, it's like i guess it's like dialects that's a, that's a good question that? i think yeah it's uh yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, languages that are very similar to each other in India. So I guess, yeah. But anyway, I'm I'm so Westernized that I'm probably the worst person to ask. <laughs> my whole point was, I I'm so Westernized that I don't speak my native tongue. That when I went to India to visit my grandma and my uncles and relatives who can barely speak English, well, like the only thing we could do to bond was play sudoku and watch tom and jerry because of the lack of a dialogue in tom and jerry we could laugh no matter what it right was. right well that's why yeah that's why it's timeless because yeah that's the thing you know with silent with with stuff that doesn't require talking it can be boring to watch i mean i even find it boring to watch sometimes but you can't deny the universality of it oh yeah yeah it is like it's like with the old silent movies, like I guess like Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton movies. Like, even though like I don't laugh at all the quips, like there are still stuff that when I watch, say, a Modern Times or City Lights or move films like that, I do laugh at it because it's like you don't need the words. Like, no, there's no language barrier. You're just watching this guy be silly and be really like allow himself to be a fool and uh -huh. that's what i think is so that's why i think i kind of love charlie chaplin is that he's his character like the character of the what do you call it he's the like his character that he portrays in all the films the tramp yeah, the yeah character yeah. of the tramp with the top hat the cane the mustache the whole thing it's like he's He's the silliest person, and by societal standards, he's the person who should be looked down at the most. But he's definitely the most carefree, happiest person in in any of the movies. Yeah, yeah. Like he's the only person who seems like he's having a good time. Sure. That's yeah, that's true. Yeah, and there's 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 always something cool about that. Just uh, 
seeing a character go through hell and yet he's just completely chill about it all and yes nothing you know everything just yes what, what is the metaphor everything just flies off your back whatever it is well yeah he's just going off of the i i, I a metaphor doesn't come <laughs> to mind but like that but that's exactly it like he just accepts whatever's happening and goes on and moves through it which i guess is is a very good way to look at life just to to be present in the moment and just take it as it is and don't get too hung up on things and just enjoy. Yeah. Wow. I agree. This is a beautiful conversation. Char- Charlie we- Chaplin. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> how, how does, how does, how is no one listed Charlie Chaplin as their hero? We got to, we got to list more fictional characters as our role models because role I, mo- fictional yeah. characters, they can't let you down. You know, once that, you get, once you get to so know your true. heroes, like my, just the shit I've been hearing about Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King and all these people, they had their flaws, but Charlie Chaplin, man. Well, yeah, and right, not even Charlie Chaplin, but... Or the, right, or the Tramp character. Just the tra- right, the Tramp. But that's so true because all of our real-life heroes are all human, so of course they have some faults, and if you get too deep and you learn too much, you will get disappointed eventually. Mm-hmm. something will disappoint you yeah um which i mean again it, it shows their humanity but also you idolize them so much if, if you if you put so much of your of your identity into another person that you look to as inspiration that might not be a good recipe because they're also human and they're also going to have the same faults as you do so there's i mean i think there's a good advice there's good advice in like having multiple role models and only picking right like picking like i like neil degrasse tyson or something because he's a great he's really good at scientific exploration and is very curious and i admire that about them yeah but i don't admire you know everything about him because i'm assuming that he has some flaws in something so i'm going to admire like Martin Scorsese in his ability to invoke emotion you know what I mean like there's you pick and choose certain elements of people to be your role model so you don't put all of your chips into one basket that is true and yeah like I I think about my parents and uh I know at like at like a very young age we almost see our parents most of us most of us here see our parents as like superheroes Mm -hmm. like they can do no wrong we love them so much and then as we get older we see flaws in them and they're no longer these superheroes in our lives, and uh, that don't it, and and then you kind of it's come so you you see them as like superheroes, and then you're like oh you in your teen years like oh parents you suck you don't get me, and then like right. I think summer usually in like your twenties you're like oh yeah, you almost have just like this newfound respect for your parents. You're like despite how flawed they were, they were still able to do all this stuff for you. Right, they, they and still... they almost like regain hero status, but yeah. not superhero status. They're like, damn, you did all this shit. I'm like, you know, I'm I'm about to turn thirty next year, and I'm like, dude, my my dad had me. He had he had two kids. He was hustling every day, working nights. I'm like, man, the respect I have for him now is just off the charts. Yeah, it's it's like, well, they. It, because I get what you're saying. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in my twenties and I'm, I'm just, I, and I feel like I, I'm in, I'm at that stage now where you just described where I'm re I'm seeing my parents again in this new way because I see, you know, cause they're, you know, I see their humanity and I respect them for all they've done despite that. Yeah. How old were your uh, parents when they had you? Well, they got married really young, but they waited. They waited okay. to have my brother because it was my, it's my brother, then me, and then my little sister. Gotcha. And so they were, you know, they were definitely adults when they had me. So they, you know, they did have time to, you know, just be in their married relationship and figure okay. that out first, which I think was I mean, I would assume that's helpful. That's probably you know? that's probably smart. Yeah. Yeah. Like you just you get time to understand each other, you know, your partner's dynamics, because you know, then you can translate that into 
raising kids. Yeah. I want to, I want to ask you, um, because I want to talk about the web series. Oh right. yes, 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 yes. Code switched because okay. I watched I watched some of the episodes yesterday. Cool. It's it's funny, like genuinely, like I'm not. It not is. Guessing I'm, you. Yeah. It, it's it's good. Like it, it is. Again, I see so many things that call themselves co- comedic things, and they never make me laugh. This genuinely, I was just laying in my bed, and I was watching the episodes, and I was just having a good time. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that you guys, one made that. Thank you for that. Dude, that's what's up. That's huge. Appreciate yeah. that. No, for real. Um, and, you, and, and you're, I mean, obviously, I, I know that you are a funny actor because we have actually worked together. I don't know. People watching may not know this, but when I was a sophomore, was, it, was I a freshman or a sophomore? I was maybe a freshman. So this was like three Three years ago? Was it that no, it wasn't that long ago, was it? Okay, I was we, like we were we worked we worked on a couple shorts together. We worked on um on uh what's it called? Proof of Grey, which was in January. The yes. one where, the one where you had me smoke all those cigarettes and like <laughs> fucking ten degrees. And then uh what was yes. it? When did we, when did we shoot thank you note? I can check my email history thank super you. quick. Thank you. Yes, no. Thank you. No. Thank you. No was the one we did first. That was for a class pro. Well, both were for a film project, for a film right. class project. And um I had fun with Thank You No. Thank You No was very Yeah. Fun. Thank You No was a good time. Thank You No was uh last year. It was uh February no 2019. Yeah. Well, I mean, 2020 felt like four years in itself. So I guess. I get, yeah, I guess. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah this I was guess, February. It wasn't last that year. long. Yeah. Yeah. 2020 adds like 20 years to your perceived thought of time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah. no, yeah. Well, thank you. No, yeah. And you and you were the. Um, so just just so to give some context, thank you note is was a little short that we did that I directed. And uh, this guy, Alex Shear, wrote. For, we did this for class and you were we had three actors and you were one of the actors and you were i mean we uh you were so fun to work with because you were so one you're you you just have a naturally funny essence um and uh and and the character that you played was menacing which was also cool because you were menacing but you also were like funny so it was kind of like you were playing against what you normally do but it was still it was still a humorous piece and uh, we also had this very uh, lovely Joette Waters. Was, oh yeah, who I've known for years. This is my first time actually working with her, which is, I mean, she, well, she she's a, she's just like the utmost professional in the business for like forever. Well, it is crazy because she does all of these shorts for students. Like she will always be the one because you know so many film students at DePaul, they you know they write shorts, but it's hard to cast older people because it's very easy to find 20 to 30 year old actors but to find a good actor who can play grandma or someone in their 50s or 60s or 70s is difficult but she is able to do that and she's really convincing in 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 her role in that yeah. and it was very fun to do that with her um so yeah so the so the short film was about and I don't want to get too detailed with the explanation but like it was about Basically, this gangster is, he has to secure this deal with another gangster who's about to come over to his house. But while they're having this meeting, uh, the grandma comes in. The grandma pays her grandson a surprise visit, and she then goes in and is a part of the meeting. But the gangsters, which is you and this other actor, Joe Metcalf, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's correct. Um you guys have a conversation, but you're trying to like, he, Joe is trying to keep it on the down low, but you're like, what the fuck? Why is your grandma here? Why can't, why can't we just talk about this? So anyway, it was really fun. Uh, and then Proof of Grey was a very mini short that I did, which is based on a television pilot that I've been writing, but I really condensed it. It's really just like a reflection of the TV pilot. It's, it not, it's not really connected to the plot at all, but it has the same kind of like, um idea behind it uh-huh. about this uh this euthanasia doctor who's secretly performing euthanasia on patients who ask them to yeah it's really dark again 
and we needed an actor. Um, and like I gave you like, didn't I ask you like the night before? Dude, you asked me. What was, was that through Facebook? You were like, hey, uh, this actor from New York. He said he was gonna be here, and he's not here. Oh uh, yeah, that was insane because. Amar, who's a friend of mine, was a part of trying to assemble the cast. Okay. And Amar was looking on all these websites, and Amar was like, yo, I got this guy from New York who's interested and wants to fly in to do this short. And I'm like, first of all, wow, I don't know how you found this individual who was willing to pay for his plane ticket (laughs) to do this this short. And this Um, was pre-COVID when flight prices were still kind of insane. Right. This this was pre-COVID. Just, just like a month before COVID. A month before. Yeah, it was right before, right before COVID. And he couldn't do it. So I was like, who's an actor that I like to work with? <laughs> who, I, who, I, who, who I know would have the, have the temperament to do this. And it, the you, temperament of uh, killing somebody mercilessly. Well, you know, I meant like the temperament as someone who would just, as an actor who would take on the role at the last minute and would have a good attitude about it. And oh, gotcha. like, how could you do this to me? Like, <laughs> um, But anywho, that's our history. We do have a history. And so I saw your Instagram advertisements for on your, on your um, page about Code Switch. And I was like, man... I'd love to have George on the show because I, I enjoy George and I, and I, and I love to, I would love to talk to him. Um, could you just tell us like what this web series is about and how you got on the project? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically code switched. Uh, it takes place in Chicago. We filmed this a couple of years ago. Um, pretty much like half the team is now in LA, which is kind of nuts. But um so it, it basically follows just five South Asian characters in their 20s, just navigating life, you know, um, a big part of being a second generation immigrant, as with, as with anybody. You want, you want to please your parents, but you also have your own dreams and aspirations. And uh, so we often see the parents of these characters, and uh, uh, we kind of get these uh, comparisons of the characters and how they live. Um, yeah, we just we just see what it's like. It's very, you know, day in the life of these five South Asian characters. Um, they don't meet at all until like the very last moment in the last part of the episode. So it's kind of cool. You see like little teasers of them crossing paths and stuff. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah. How, how, how did you get involved with this? So I got involved with this. Um, so in addition to your film, I've also done other student films, uh, some with DePaul students, some with the uh, other universities. And uh, the director of Code Switch, he, I believe he just graduated from DePaul. And uh, he has a lot of friends from DePaul. And uh, apparently he, uh, the, director, the director and writer, his name is Karin Sunil. Mm-hmm. He, saw, he saw me in a couple of student films. He's like, yeah, th- he saw some like screenshots and he's like, yeah, I think that guy's Indian. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should hit this guy up. I should, I haven't seen him before. That was it. Just this guy's Indian. Yeah, this guy's Indian. Let me see. Let me see what he's about. <laughs> and um, yeah, I remember I was like walking out of an improv workshop at like 9 30 PM. And all of a sudden I get this like on Facebook messenger, this like random request. It's like, hi, this person would like to message you. I'm like, okay, dude. And then it's it's just Karn cold, you know, basically cold introducing himself. He's like, hey, Steven, uh, not to be a creep, but I saw you in this uh, short film. Uh, <laughs> if you want to, hey, feel free to call me up. Uh, we can talk about it. And, you know, we met up. So I guess he figured out based on my last name, which is George, that um, a, lot of, a lot of Indians, we have very like Americanized names. So my name is Stephen George. Mm-hmm. Um, so he fig- he was actually writing a Malayali Christian character, which is what I am in real life. And yeah. so he's like, yeah, uh, you're basically the only person I know in all of Chicago who's an actor and who's also Malayali Christian. So I think he just, we just met up in person to make sure I wasn't crazy. And, uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, that was, it was easy. No audition, no nothing. I no was, the, I was basically the like, only one. I'm the only, I was the only one. Wow. I think wow. he, I think he said if he didn't find me, he would have just put himself in that role, which he was kind of hesitant to do because he's not an actor. Uh-huh. 
So this was like his last. You were the last piece of the puzzle. I was. I was out of the five main characters. I was the last one uh, that he cast. I yeah. remember all the other four main characters. They're all like really well renowned, like touring comedians, and uh, one of them's like a legendary improviser. So I'm like, I'm like the, uh, I'm like the black sheep out of the top, out of the top <laughs> five. Well, you you do a, you do a really good job, man. You you do a really good job. Um, I I. Uh, I uh, I get the I get where the director's coming from when he sends you that text of I don't mean to be a creep because sometimes it's so uh, awkward for <laughs> directors to reach out and be like hey can I to like actors that they think would be great for roles because I I know this I have have had this experience yeah it's like you don't want to come off as needy but the actor knows that oh I. I the only reason I'm contacting you is because I need you for this. I wouldn't be <laughs> contacting you if I didn't need sure. you right now. So you want to come off as as cool as possible, but also it's like you just want to be honest with the fact that oh, I, I think you're really talented. I think we could do something great together. Did you have to? Did you have to reach out to Joette, or was she just like gung ho from the start? And did she did she like submit? We to had to project? reach out, but she was okay. very gracious. I mean, I haven't. Even with uh, the the climb, like with Matt, our actor, I mean, we had auditions. He he came in for the audition, but he was very he was he didn't put up a front or anything. He was very into the script, and when we gave him the role, it was like, oh yeah, cool, I could totally do this. Um, I haven't had a, an experience with an actor who was like playing hard to get or like being weird about it. Just if you lay, if you feel like as a director, if you're just honest and you lay yourself out there and you're not holding anything back. The mm-hmm. actor isn't going to hold anything back unless they're like a sociopath or they're like a crazy actor or actress. Yeah. Who just is just doing it for the attention. I don't like, I don't like, what do you think about that? I think, I think for the most part, um, out of all the projects I've worked on, I think I've only met like two uh, people that were, especially in Chicago, like we're, we're, you know, we're pretty much like that, you know, we have the stereotype of being like blue collared workers we let her work uh mm-hmm. talk for ourselves yeah i feel like for the most part like if you reach out to an actor they're like overjoyed to work on your project they're like flattered to do so i've only met like two divas on set that were like nobodies like one one uh, i remember this one girl she was like she like just became 18 and she was cast in some in a student film mm-hmm. and she's like and she, she you know she had just signed some like form that said um that she would allow herself to be in the film. And she's like, I want to, you know, she, she was like, she's making all these like dumb requests. She's like, I, I don't want to be, I want to make sure this film is taken down in a year. I'm going to be as big as Brad Pitt. I don't want this to hurt my career. And it's just like, it was just, it was just so insane. She, she ended up getting kicked off set. Uh, oh, which was it, like, like how you're, like how you were talking about, 20 year olds playing grandparents uh she was basically this 18 year old was going to play the mom of a character that was older than her and it just it made absolutely no sense anyway so i'm like deep down i'm like this 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 casting didn't make sense anyway so yeah i I wish more directors were more uh uh you know willing to reach out to older actors because many times older actors just sitting around just like hoping they can get cast in more projects you know yeah there we, we just don't see him enough in uh film and tv older actors which is really sad yeah i i do think that is changing a little bit but you you are right it's it's there's it's i mean again most leads of film or television shows are 20 30 year olds People yeah. like to write 20, 30 year olds. And I, I get that because you, you know, you typically want to watch a protagonist that's like active and going towards something that has a lot of potential, but at the same time, why can't you do that with someone who's 60 or 70? There's no reason why that person can't be going on a journey or discovering something about themselves. You know, yeah, you have to. And that's wonder, just like, as interesting, if not more interesting, to do I th- that I at think, the end I of think your it's life. Way more interesting, but yeah, you, you, you got to wonder, like, how much of this is just like sex appeal and eye candy? They're like, 
yeah, the script might not be the greatest, but if, at least if we have an attractive person filling up the frame, maybe we can keep people's interest. Well, that, that for some films, that definitely is a large part of it. Because, yeah, especially if you're like, you know, the right, you know, this right is script. Ain't that good, man. Like I said, yeah. it's, it's not that good. But hey, Angelina Jolie needs a project because she needs money or something. Not saying that Angelina Jolie would do this. She's <laughs> a very good actress. Yeah. I'm sure she has she has high standards. But like, say if you if if an actress or a high, you know, profile actress who was attractive had was in a position where, you know, I kind of need to just do a movie just to to get money because I I just need to pay my bills that happens like you totally know when that's happening like when a movie's just like this is bad but how did this otherwise very talented actor or actress decide to do this and you're just like oh well it's probably just the the director or or the producer or whoever was financing the film felt that it needed eye candy and that, that was <laughs> which is which probably. is terrible yeah i've been i've been invited to way too many uh, i'll have like friends I'll have like hyper masculine friends like, hey, we should see this movie. I'm like, the movie sucks, but it's got like an attract, like yeah. it's got like an attractive uh, female sidekick. I'm like, oh, I get it. You just, you yeah. just want to watch porn, but you don't want to watch porn. So right. You you want to you want to you want to subliminally feel what you feel when you watch porn. Exactly. Right? But you don't want to feel bad about it. So it's you're just yeah. Look it through this. Yeah. But uh, man, I watched. Back- that. yeah it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a <laughs> it's a bit of a dead end that you kind of have to back beep, you just kind of have to call that like half okay, a mile like, right. okay we're uh we're making but a u-turn we're gonna make switched. a three-pointer yes code switched i want to i really because it's so funny and all all the actors in it are talented like everyone and what i loved about watching it was even as someone who again i don't come from the background of these characters you know i i i didn't grow up in that culture but I found it hilarious and I found it very relatable. I was watching it and the writing is just, it's, it's funny regardless of what race or ethnicity you or you stem from. And it's, it's great because I mean, I, I do one of my best friends uh, is Indian. And uh, again, that doesn't make me at all a um, expert on the culture sure. um, because I don't uh, because, but sometimes he will tell me stuff and mm. like, like he'll tell me things that he has to like go through, like, you know, his parents doesn't want, doesn't want him to marry someone who's out of his race. You know what I mean? Like, or they yeah. don't, they, it's not that they don't allow it, but they frown upon it. Like there's uh-huh. just certain things that I've just been fed subliminally through my friend. And so again, I kind of, I kind of understood those references in it a little bit but that's not what's really i mean those get get laughs but that's not really what's funny about it what's funny is it's just like it's these adults trying to get through life with with and and they just happen to be this culture and and that happens to be a part of their lives yeah yeah like uh uh i remember vic vic who plays kind of the the frat boy character in the series he said like yeah this could be this this they don't have to be indian they could be chinese they could be greek they could be it's yeah all the all the it's very i think it's very relatable and uh one thing that's been really cool especially during our crowdfunding uh part of the series was the we we just got donations from everywhere we got donations from like africa and france and australia just just the most, uh, it was like every single ethnicity. It was insane. Just like everybody found the trailer relatable, which was, I'm like, yeah, they, they always say there's a relatability in being, what's, what's it like? The more specific you are, the more relatable it is, the more universal right. it is. And it's, sure. yeah, it was really cool to see that. Yeah. Your, your character, Tom, um, he is a, again, you, you kind of talked to him earlier, talked about him earlier, but the, one of the main conflicts, at least that I saw in the first few episodes, was that he wants to make this app. Uh huh. It's, it's a dating app, correct? Like he wants to make it's this a dating yeah, app. it's a it's a dating app. We yeah. we don't really get get into it too much. We actually, you know, in almost like one of the very last revisions of the script, we uh, Karn was still not a hundred percent sure what the app would be about. Uh-huh. We're like, they're like, yeah, it'd be funny. It'd be funny to make it about dating. You can get a punchline out of that. Yeah. No, I mean it's 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 funny that he's he's you know throwing himself completely in this dating app. It 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 is it is a little humorous, but like 
what, what, where the conflict arises is that you're making this app and you want to dedicate yourself to that, but your dad, you're the character of uh, Tom's father uh-huh. wants him to, I forget, does he want him to get an MBA or he want, yeah, he wants me to, um, he just wants me to apply to, uh, so he, there's a, there's a scene where he's like, Hey son, I've got connections at Deloitte. Just if you want to apply to them, just work with them, get that guaranteed paycheck. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go to this, uh, you know, independent route and just take all these risks, you know? So yeah, he wants, he wants me to go to grad school. He wants me to apply, you know, traditionally and just work for a firm and make money that way. Just, just basically minimal risks, you know, yeah. low risk, medium reward. I want to, I want to get into your acting process here. And I'm going okay. to, I'm going to start off by asking, did you, I mean, how was it easy to get into the character of Tom? Could you relate to Tom? How, how did you go about playing Tom? Oh, also, uh, Tom, Tom is, was the, uh, in the first draft, his name was Tom. We ended up making his name Joe, but, uh, his name was originally Tom George. And then, uh, we ended up changing his name to Joe Joseph Matthew. So uh, yeah, his his name is technically Joe. Oh, his name is technically uh, Joe. His name okay. is Joe. But uh, is, is is his name ever said in the his his uh, in the show? Because in the episodes, I don't hear his name said. I'm trying to think. There was an older version of the pilot um, where you do hear his name said. Um, you hear you hear it once in a while, not that often. Um. Yeah, and the original pilot, which was cut, you do hear it more often. So okay, so but but it it is Joe. It is Joe. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad I'm glad we cleared that up. It's Joe. It's not Tom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Forget, it we've been saying Tom this You're whole time. Good, well, man. It was Tom. It was Tom. It was Tom. The character in the okay. in an earlier draft, um, his name was Tom George, but I guess that's too similar to my name, um, so we changed it. We changed it to Joseph Matthew. Um. I like- how did I get the name of Tom then? I think I think it must have your Instagram his, his, post. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. I don't even who knows. So it doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway. Tom, uh, Tom Joe is the same. It's the yeah, same. It's, it's, you know, they're all generic three letter names. <laughs> but surprisingly, I found it kind of difficult. Um, you know, a lot of people watch TV and film because there's the whole idea of escaping from Mm -hmm. your everyday life and it's nice to just enter this like fantasy world and just forget about life and with this character which is so closely based on my life um i basically had to play myself so i would Mm. dude i was overthinking it so much oh okay so uh, you you find it much harder to play someone that's close to you than someone who's not i i really struggled um we shot a few when we were doing the crowdfunding campaign before we shot the series we shot these like uh, like one to two minute bits that we were releasing uh, every mm-hmm. week to kind of give the crowdfunding campaign some juice. Yeah. Um, and uh, me, I generally play the like the voice of reason, the straight character, and a lot of a lot of the other characters are very zany, and I kind of bring it back to a reality, and you see humor in that. Mm-hmm. So many times I would play the scene, I would just be so low energy um thinking that would work i'm like these characters are so like insane and over the top i think it'd be funny if i was like low and yeah. it, it, many times the scene would not be funny it wouldn't hit that way so it's tough like you want to play yourself but at the same time you have to like sens- sensationalize pertinent parts of the scene to make the punchline work so like there's a part in the first episode of code switched um where my coding partner uh his his uh he's like do you remember that scene where we're both at the table? I'm on my laptop looking for jobs. Mm, and then the yes. character, and he and he's like, are you looking for jobs? And I'm like, yes. And then he's like, move. You're wasting your time. And then I like blow up. I'm like, why don't you tell that to my dad? Mm. And then he's like, if we, if we crush this app, he's going to be calling you dad. And uh, you're so but, angsty in that scene. Yeah. And it's, you're, you're you're like an angsty teenager in that scene, which is not normally what you play. You're yeah. normally not like that in real life at that's, all. That's correct. Normally, I would totally brush it off. I would not find that offensive. Yeah. But for the purpose of that scene, I blew up because I knew it would be, it would be funnier. 
Because mm-hmm. many times comedy is just like a release of tension. So me blowing up, you get all of this tension. And then Sam's character, he completely releases it with his punchline. And many times that's like one of the biggest laughs of the series because people expect it to like escalate into a fight, but then it's, it's immediately, it, you know. It's, it's diffused. Of, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was a certain point where it's like, okay, we've got this comedic beach. I have to kind of not play what I would normally do just to make the comedy work of that scene. It was a mix of trying to play myself, but also trying to make this this scene as funny as possible. Yeah. How do you prepare to make those maneuvers in a scene? Like beforehand, before you start working with your other actors, do you do you think to yourself, oh, okay, you know, since since the energy is like this in the scene, I should play it like this. And on this specific line, I should do this. Or do you figure that out in rehearsals with the actors? And that's where you figure it out. Like how So that's a good that's a really good question. Um so we with Code Switched, we, we originally shot a pilot back in 2017. And most of us didn't really get to know each other. We didn't really trust each other yet. We didn't really get each other's vibes yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in that original pilot, the performances are very stiff. Um, and we were all just like practicing our head. I'm like, yeah, we think the scene is going to go this way. And we'd have rehearsals and table reads and stuff. Yeah. Um, so in the original pilot, we were very much like, this is what we're going to do. Um, and hopefully it works. Um, many times, Karn was still pretty new to directing at that point. So he would just tell me, don't do it that way, do it this way. Um, we did, There was just kind of a lack of trust in the beginning. But mm-hmm. once we'd known each other for a year and the crowdfunding campaign was done and we reshot the pilot, I mean, we were all like buddies at this point. We were all going to each other's comedy shows. At mm-hmm. that point, um, we trusted each other a lot more. And this time, uh, the director, Karn, he'd be like, yeah, just do it the way you, you think you'd do it, and then we'll make some minor adjustments. So all of a sudden, we weren't really planning anything ahead of time. We were actually listening to each other. We, uh, many times, we were given the ability to improvise, um, as long as it you know, stayed somewhat um, according to the script. And that made a huge difference. So that scene where I blew up at the table, that wasn't really planned. I, I kind of knew it like, yeah, I should, I should bump up my energy in the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Sam, who was sitting next to me, he didn't, he, he didn't know that was coming. He didn't know I was going to explode. So his reaction to me exploding was very natural. It was authentic. He, him banging the table. And uh, yeah, that was authentic, which is cool. Yeah. Forgive me. Who is was what 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 was the director's name again? Uh, his name is uh, Karen. It's Karen. Uh, K-A-R-A-N. It's like okay. K- Karen, but with an A right. instead of Karen. An a. And Karen. Yeah, busy at Karen. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So how did he? How did he? What was his directing style? How did he interact with you guys? And what was his way of going about it? Like giving he, you guys uh, notes and stuff. He uh yeah once once we got to. In, once we got to know each other, he really trusted everybody a lot more, which made the performances so much better. Um, the way the way the show was cast, uh, a lot of the characters they're not really actors. A lot of them are performing comedians and improvisers. Uh, so a lot of very naturally funny people. Mm-hmm. And Karen's like, it's probably he he realized it's it's probably best not to try to force the performances. He's like everybody's got their own natural flavor of comedy. I'm going to trust them to do their own thing. And uh, basically we're just shooting for the edit at that point. We're like, okay, just do your thing. And then we'll do it somewhere slightly different. And then we'll figure it out in the editing room. We'll figure out which scene is the funniest. And then we'll just pick that one. So that was cool. The uh, man, just, just when, it, when, it, when that trust is there, um, it makes a huge difference. Like, Karn was so good at building an atmosphere where everybody felt like their input was valued. Like I would do a scene and then like somebody in the makeup room, like two rooms over would be like, yeah, you know, maybe you should change that word slightly. And uh, it it would make the scene so much better because uh, there was just that atmosphere of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Everybody felt like their input was valuable, which was really cool. Yeah. What, how how do you prefer to be directed by a director? Like for for well well one for a comedy and one for drama. Like, is there a uh-huh. difference that you prefer? Like or is it the I, same? Um uh, it, it dep- 
depends. I think for the most part, at least for my character in Code Switched, um, I never try to force the comedy. You know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. you know, like like you said, it's it's more about the comedic situations more than the actual punchlines. So for my character, who's like the voice of reason, it just it just made sense for me to act like it was almost like a drama. Like I would just react naturally mm -hmm. to what people who were saying me. Um, if I if I would to kind of like force the punch, I'm like, hey, this is the this is the punchline, guys. <laughs> it, it, it it just you know it, right. it, it doesn't respect the audience, and it's just it's hard. It was hard to watch. There there are like there are takes where I kind of forced the I try to force the comedy too much. And I would try to change the lines to make them funnier, and it, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, many times, yeah, just just me just saying what was happening in the scene. Like, uh, there's a scene uh, in the second episode. I think it's the cold open in the second episode, where me and Vic's character were sitting on a on my on his car. Yeah, and, uh, and then he, the guy he's, he's like naming all. He's up. like yeah that and and me in uh, in many takes I was trying to be funny uh just trying to come up with funny lines and it was just never funnier than just me just naturally responding to the insanity mm -hmm. so yes yeah yeah so and then so you liked the fact that right because because that that that's your decisions right and and did did uh karen yeah did karen did he like was he fully like, did he tell you, hey, stop adding stuff? Like, hey, stop. Or was he just like, I'll let you make your decisions and then I'll, you'll figure it out because I trust that you'll figure it, it out. It was both. It was both. At first, he's like, yeah, I trust you. Just do whatever. And then, and, and, and then as he'd watch the scene, he's like, yeah, no, just, just stick to the script on that line. It's not, it's, you know, once, once you, uh, I've, at that point, I probably knew Karn close to two years, you know. Mm -hmm. He's he's not he's not going to sugarcoat anything. He's like, yeah, no, just say just say the line. Well, let's let's you know we're 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 stealing a Burger King parking lot. We can only be here for so long. Let's just just say the line. It's funnier that way, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll move on to the next scene. So in that case, it was it was both. So at first he let me do whatever, and I was playing with the line several times, mm -hmm. and we just noticed it. Just did, we just noticed the scene which was perfectly written at that point. So even though I tried it a few different lines different ways it just worked out better for me to do the scene as it was written did you figure out were, were there some instances where you did experiment and it worked like you tried that like over and over again and actually did turn into something that was good yeah i'm trying to notice <clears throat> i know um there was yeah there's even like even like karen he would uh he would um the one thing, the one thing with me and with the other actors that was different. So a lot of these actors, um, a lot of the other actors, because they're comedians and because they're improvisers on stage, they're used to projecting out really loudly. And Karin would often have to bring their performances down for the camera because mm -hmm. many times they would overact. And me, because I've had much more experience on camera, many times he would tell me to kind of bring up the energy. Mm -hmm because I was so used to like whispering, I, I would be like, I'd be like whispering into the mic and he couldn't even hear what I was saying. He's like, uh, did you say the line? I'm like, yeah, I said it. And the sound guys, they can, the sound guys like, yeah, no, he said it, it sounded good. <laughs> um, but yes, one of, yeah, one of my best lines, some of my best lines were just like me whispering the lines because uh, I don't know, wh whispering is such a good acting trick, like in general, like uh, I was, um, if you like, if you like, watch like The Walking Dead, and it's yeah. all these, it's all these British actors, but they're all doing American voices, mm -hmm. and like Andrew Lincoln, he like whispers like half of his lines, but it sounds so good because he's like whispering them. You can't really tell, like, like if if he was like screaming those lines, you can kind of hear the British nuances of his accent. But yeah, something about whispering it just like hides, hides a, a lot of the uh, British accent, which is. So I, there, there are some parts in Coast which where I'm like whispering and it works. And um... there were there was a scene at the end of episode two, I think, where you're eating that tiramisu. That's oh, yeah. And the line where you like after you take a bite, you're like, why would you use like two? <laughs> like you like you like like, why would you use two different types of trials? But you yeah. say the like subtle way. I don't know what you, you're kind of like. You're, you're kind of like saying it while you're 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Macking on your food, and that that was that was that was hilarious. Thanks, man. That was yeah. That, that was, was a, that's a funny scene in general. It's it's a it's a I think it's one of the best arcs. The whole N word scene and seeing it culminate in that. Yeah, that was fun. And yeah, I don't think I don't think I got really got any direction for that scene. Um, for that, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I think it'd be fun. It's always funny to be talking while having food in your mouth. There's something funny about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell people about the N word arc? Yeah. Because oh yeah. yeah. So um, drop that without explaining that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in episode two, here's the thing. Yeah. Black people out there. Here's the thing, black people. <laughs> Uh, when oh, you're okay. not around, when you're not around, uh, we we non-black people will sometimes say the n-word to each other. It'll be especially Indian. Well, I don't. Indi- but other people, other people do. Yeah. I'll I'll be honest. I used to when I was in like high school. Yeah. Because it was the cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. Like me, I'll I'll just like hang out with other like Indian guys or. I I, guys I know people who do that. I I know white some, guys. Who some do people, it. some people, yeah, some people still do it. And it's yeah. not just an Indian thing. It's a white white people will do it. Um, we'll we'll say the N word when uh, nobody's around. It's it's not as common now because um, over time the N word has become like more offensive than the F word. Like it's it's really yeah. kind of cemented itself as like don't do it. You, you not even in private. Yeah, you you really can't get away with it anymore. Which is good. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a gross word, but. Yeah, but the so the scene in Code Switched, um, basically it's me hanging out um, with uh, my Indian roommate, and uh, we've got two black friends that are sitting a little bit further away, and then our and then our colleague from high school pops in the frame, and he he drops the N word. Mm-hmm. Maybe he maybe he doesn't see the two black guys that are in the background, and he's like, "Yeah, these are my brown boys. Let me say the N word because that's what we've done in high school." And, right, uh, because I mean, do you think that's just? Because I mean, I I can't I find I found it kind of you know believable because I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen with like other people who are not black doing that, and it was and you could it's just it was a very comical way to discuss that and make light of that, but also it felt like by the end of the arc um when you when all the characters were like talking about it and they were reflecting about it they were like yeah it doesn't really matter it doesn't it's just a word sure you don't really care it's like it's it's i mean like don't say it but like how much power is a word gonna have anymore you know uh-huh. I, I i liked that element of the arc it was like yeah that was offensive but like i'm okay like whatever yeah, I, I remember that was like a really tricky scene to write with the, the with the three black friends in the mm-hmm. in the kitchen. Yeah, um, I remember like all three all three of those guys they had to like confirm that they were okay with what they were saying in the scene because it's it's such a touchy issue. Mm-hmm. It and, is, yeah. Uh, and uh, like each of them have like slightly different perspectives. Like one of them's like, yeah, it's just a word, you know. Yeah, yeah, the n word is bad, but we're taking we're taking the n word back for ourselves. And another character is like super chill about it. He's like, yeah, what you know, they say, they say the N word, who cares? And the other character is like, you cannot say the N word. Right. If you're not black. So they, they all have three different perspectives, which is interesting. And I think, I think that's just like real life. You know, we all have, mm-hmm. I, I have a friend who says, I have, I have an older friend who will say the N word, you know, uh, not, not in a humorous way, but he'll try to say it in like a, almost like a, He's trying when he's trying to explain a situation, um, or when he's trying to like recall a memory, he'll say that he'll say the N word. I'm like, yeah, you don't really have, to. and I'm like, yeah, you don't really have to say it, but I get it. And yeah, I mean, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't add anything to the sentence. Mm-hmm. It's like any other swear word; it doesn't like add any meaning to it other than just like I threw it in just to spice it up, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's doing to spice it up. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 good that. It was, yeah, it was it was a really great arc, and it, that all was just in one episode. But it was really, it was really interesting to watch that, and you guys handled it with, I think, a lot of honesty. And I think what you're saying is right. Like you had those three guys with three different perspectives mm-hmm. on it, and that, and that felt very real. 
It's very well written. The show is the show is is very good. I want a lot of people to see it. You know, it's it's very- it's really well written, which is which is the best thing. Like when so, when something's so well written, you don't have to overact it. It's better not like like the like uh, right. it's basically like the Onion. The Onion, uh, they never want you to overact anything. They just want you to play it as straight and uh, almost as like you know. They 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 hate it when you overact scenes because they they know their scenes are so well written. They've done millions of drafts of their sketches, mm-hmm. and I, I think Code Switch is very similar. Like the punchline is there, you know you don't have to milk it. Just say the line. It's going to be funnier just to act naturally, and and the comedy will work. You know, yeah. trust, trust the writing. Yeah, yeah. As long as long as the writing well for comedy, as long as the writing's good, and the actors are good. All you need really is a competent director and it'll be good. Like you can just yeah. trust in that. Like you just need, you just need to just put the camera in a way that captures the actors where you get the comedy and it's going to work. It's going to work no matter uh. what. I mean, I guess it's, it's kind of like in drama where it's like if the writing is good and the actors are good. If you, if you just capture a wide two mediums, two close ups. The scene will still, I mean, it won't be that interesting. But it will <laughs> probably come out good. Yeah. Because the writing and the acting is good. And that's, you know, and we're capturing that. Yeah. And, you know, just, just find some solid royalty-free dramatic music and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Just need, just need, and yeah, you, you good lighting, obviously. I mean, I mean there's, there's more to it, but it's like, those are the core elements of it all. And if you have that, then then you have a chance of making something good. If you don't have that, then uh, you're done. It's like... I, I saw that you were writing a, a sci-fi. Uh, are there other... What, uh, what genres do you write uh, in general? Every time, every next script, I try to write something that's different. So... Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Right now... Um, well, Niobe is the web series that is currently um, we're figuring out the budget for. We're, we're going to make a trailer for that. Okay. Make we're we're that's where we're at. We're we're going to make a trailer for it, and we're budgeting all the episodes and figuring we're basically you know pre planning it all out right now. Yeah. Um, the episodes are written though, and we've decided like what we're going to do as far as that. Is it is it purely sci fi or is it a a mix of genres? I mean, it's 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 drama. Yeah, it's it's a dramatic sci-fi piece. It's not like on another planet. It, it's in like the world, but on the advent of like mainstream humanoid AIs entering into people's homes. Like that's like that's where we're at. Um. So that's Niobe. That that's coming out. Um, okay. The the short film that's gonna come out this winter that I directed, I didn't write that. My co-director wrote that. Uh, was that was that the 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 climb? The climb, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, got it. But the one the the, the piece that I'm writing now is called Keenmaker, and that is a it's a political drama uh, about a about a young woman who is fed up with her life in corporate America. She feels detached from society. You know, she's not on the fringe of society. She's kind of in a middle ground, but she feels very detached from politics, from just how the way everything works. She feels um, kind of lost. And then she is invited to this bachelorette party for a friend that she hasn't talked to in years. And during the, at that party, she meets another friend who is the, who is connected to a uh, campaign. To, she's actually the deputy chief of staff of the North Carolina senator, uh, John Conrad. And she basically, Angelica, who's this person's friend, the, the main character's name is Nia. Um, Nia is convinced by her friend Angelica, who's the deputy chief of staff, to quit her job and to join the campaign because... Nia, if Nia, Angelica believes that if Nia is on the campaign, then she might be able, if she had, if they have that fresh new voice in the campaign, then that new voice and that influence might be able to steer Conrad into um, adopting a less centrist viewpoint that is, that is going to make him lose the election. If he, if he holds on to this like middle of the line centrist point of view, this um, corporatist point of view, it's not going to work for him. 
um, like a purely corporatist view. Um, and then at that point, what's going to happen is Nia is going to join on. There's going to be a lot of tension and conflict between the ideologies within the campaign unit. Uh-huh. And then that is, that's the show. And then the season would follow the campaign until the election. <coughs> Interesting. Excuse me. Why do you, uh, do you, yeah. do you, uh, that's interesting. I don't, I wonder, I wonder if that, is that typical for writers to, to jump from one genre to the next? Or is it, do you just sometimes do that? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I think it's a good exercise. And, uh, sure. there are some writers who are just like, I just like sci fi and that's, I'm only going to do everything I write it has to have some relation to sci fi because that's, yeah, thing I like, but I don't know. I enjoy the, I enjoy the notion that even though I I might be writing similar themes and, you know, you know, there are things that kind of are connected with each piece, the pieces do feel different and they're not like, I'm not just, I don't feel like I'm writing the same thing. And that's why I like to switch genre or at least switch like the topic of the piece. So I'm like doing something that feels a little different and it's not the same thing. Also, I heard that that's, I mean, that's what the Coen brothers do. And I'm a very big fan of the Coen brothers and their writing. Yeah. Um, so I can't deny that there's an influence there to want to do something different each time. Cause I, I like the fact that you look at the Coen brothers catalog. It's, it's not the same. It's mm-hmm. never the same kind of movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Is no, there, I mean, are there, sorry. are there, are there any genres that you're like, Nope, not not gonna do it. You you coming of age. I would not want to do. Well, uh, I wouldn't say. I, mean, I would never say never to that. But because coming of age might be interesting. But again, I never want to say never. But I would be hard pressed to imagine that I'd ever do a rom com because I don't think I'd be. <laughs> I don't think I'd be. I want. I just don't think I'd be good at that. Not that I'm. Not that I'm like dissing rom coms. I just don't think I would. Maybe. Yeah. I don't. I, I feel like you know rom coms are probably like the mo- the most formulaic type of movie. Oh well, it depends. I, I'm just thinking about. I'm just thinking about like Lifetime and Hallmark movies in general. They're they, they're pretty much following the same type of storyline for the yeah. most part. They seem like they seem like they'd be the easiest to churn out as long as you just kind of fill in the blanks. But well, uh, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you, if you were gonna write something that was like that, I mean, it would be easy. But you know, you would you know you'd be wondering as a writer, like, what could I add to this genre? Like, what what is there left to say? I mean, that's I, I think that's <laughs> always the question. It's like, what is there left to do here? What can I bring to this that you know it may not be completely original, but it's a different alteration. It's a different take on the story or the the genre. Mm-hmm. So you you have you have to wonder about that. And I, I don't know what I would do in terms of a rom com with that. I don't know what I would share. I mean, it's a love story. You know, it's it's okay, person meets person. Yeah. And they, you know, they start off, they have a surprise encounter, they meet, then they start, you know, <clears throat> they have to be convinced to do it, or some there's an event that happens that gets them to like start hanging out. And then they're slowly doing it, but they're not like fully committing yet, or they have hesitations to commit. And then something happens where it's like, oh man, you were, this was going so great, but now I can't do this. I got to leave or I got to move to California or, you know, something's happening. And then of course, then in the third act, you know, they're like, no, screw it. I love this person. I'm going to, you know, do this final test to prove that I love this person, that I'm going to get to that person. And there's and there's your movie and there's your rom com. Well, that's it, man. And that's your rom com. That's it. But then, but then, but then you gotta think. Okay, what can, what can I add? How can I make that interesting? What what can I add to that? You know. Yeah, you'd have to. Uh, I don't know. Let's say let's say let's say you absolutely you were let's say you were given, uh, just like an an insane amount of money, and you just you're like, okay, I, I can't turn this down. You and you and you yeah. had and you had to write a romantic comedy, mm-hmm. 
uh, do, you, do you feel like you could add a twist to it to make it just just for your own sanity to say that okay I, I added something to yeah. the genre yeah well I think I think especially if I'm writing a place that is uniquely me if you know because I think you know I think a lot of writers they spend so much time thinking about like oh what's the twist I'm gonna put on what's the thing oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I use that's gonna change this and be so original I think all you really have to do if you're worried about that is just just go to like think about like just yourself and your life because your life and your experience is inherently original. There is only one you, there is only one you that has lived your life. Mm -hmm. So if you go into yourself and you pull from there, you know, it, you know, it will be both original and relatable because when you're watching a film, you're trying to relate when you're writing a film, you're trying to relate to the human experience and your individual experience is inherently unique. So you're always going to be, if you're writing from a place that's generally you and you're not bullshitting, then you're always going to find something or a way to go that is relatable to you. So it's original, but also another human can relate to it. So there's relatability. That's, that's good advice. Or, or you could just or, do it, or you could yeah. just do it lifetime just did and basically just do a parody of KFC. Basically, just do a, a romantic. What, what is this? Did you not see this? No, uh, I don't know Life, what this is. Lifetime, uh, they uh, they put out like a, I think it was like an eighteen minute should, mini movie. Should I square? Should I share screen and find this? Like, what is? Do, this? Yeah, do it, do it. Look up, uh, what's it called? Just look up Lifetime KFC movie. I think th that's got to be it. Oh okay, yeah. Lifetime. This came out um, a little bit ago, about a couple of weeks ago. Get the all right. Wait, is this is this Bing search? Oh my god! This is like the. Uh, this is the. Um, I don't know. It's it's like the it's like the thing that Microsoft includes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I like yeah, it. It's actually this, good. Okay. Bing, yeah, Bing is Bing is not bad. It's, it's not. It's not the worst. It's not. It's not, it's not the worst. A, it's not Ask Jeeves. I feel like I'm being judged here. I think this is judgment. I, a, a little bit judgment. I feel like I'm being judged. Okay. <laughs> so is this what you're talking about? This is it. This is it. KFC era slams lifetime movie featuring Mario Dude, Lopez I watched as the, sexy I watched Colonel Sanders. A recipe. I'm sorry. This is crazy. Like like if you absolutely had to write a room a rom-com this is this is what i'm talking about oh what's this title it says uh kfc oh i'm sorry you got You're seven good. new messages i don't communicate with any of these i <laughs> swear ladies Opa. and gentlemen stop seeing this ad <laughs> um okay so you got the kfc heiress slams Wait, let me, what does this title say kfc heiress slams lifetime movie featuring mario lopez as sexy Colonel Sanders claiming the soap opera inspired plot was very vulgar and had a degrading tone. I mean, what? Let I mean, but we can't we can't forget that. Like, think about what this movie is about. It's about Colonel Sanders. This movie is about Colonel Sanders in a romantic story about seduction like that's that you should be just offended on that like forget the vulgar <laughs> like that's just what is that what i i would highly recommend it it's it's the oh, you, most it's the most enjoyable thing i've ever seen on lifetime you've seen this it's i saw i saw it on christmas <laughs> i uh it's 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 so funny how hot like in a scale of one to ten like correctly how good is and then like just on a level of just like funny like how, how good is it like on those metrics okay uh, critically i mean it, it's clearly a parody yeah hopefully most people would get that but i don't know i don't think the kfc heiress understood it was a parody no i think she took it very um, seriously critic i mean just on a parody level I, I would give it like a seven or eight like it's up there and then on sheer fineness like, like crit oh you mean like production value production value was perfect I, just even better than your typical lifetime movie it was what? really production value was exceptional so they put a lot of their resources into this it, it, i mean it was only about 18 minutes it wasn't a full feature so i guess 
yeah, they made it, they made it work. The the lighting was always very glamorous and you know very soft and uh, the production uh, design was just always they like they never half assed it like every every set felt complete. It was yeah it was, it was on a production value standpoint I'd probably give it like a ten. Like it was real it was it's good. Damn. It's really good. And I I watched it with a few friends and everybody was like yes this is the best thing I'm, we're so glad we watched this so. Mm-hmm. It's it's worth it for watching for sure. I'm I'm almost scared to, but I think I gotta watch it. No, you, ha- just... you have to watch it. <laughs> so I just um, where do I find this? I wonder. Um, oh, I, so know, I, I need I to know... plug my computer in. So just oh yeah, do it. Go ahead. Talking, but all right, folks. If you want to watch this Lifetime KFC movie, I know th- I know if you go to the Lifetime website, um, they you're able to watch movies for free on there. Uh, let me see if let me see if I go to the Lifetime website if you can watch the KFC movie for free on there. If not, you might just have to if you have cable or whatever. I think you could see it that way. I don't know. Recipe for seduction. Okay, so I'm on the Lifetime website. Let me see if I can watch it. Uh, I don't know. Wait. Oh, watch. Can I watch it? I think it's... Oh, dude, yeah. I can watch it. You can watch it for free on the Lifetime. I've got it, yeah. It's, I got the, the whole entire the 16-minute uh, mini-movie just popped up. Yeah, you can just go to the Lifetime Wait, movie. Can, you, and, can uh, you share your screen? Yeah, let me see if I can do that. I just, I just gave you permission. All right, sweet. That. Okay, hold on. Do, 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 do. Wow. So is it showing good. up? Is it showing yeah. up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to life, just go to the Lifetime website, type in a recipe for full uh, seduction. This is the whole movie. The whole entire thing is there. I didn't have to sign in. Maybe I'm wait. wait it's maybe. only 16 minutes long. It's only 16 minutes. Um, oh, okay. You don't have to have cable. I'm not even logged in. You can watch the full. Okay, well, don't play anything. Just yeah, we're not getting yeah. like sued. Uh. Okay. Oh, let me pause it. There you go. Sixteen minutes. Yeah, I I don't know if I could tolerate watching a. I don't know. Maybe even a ninety-minute version of this might be entertaining. But it's there. Oh my goodness. It is there. Oh my goodness, that's a real thing. So if I had to, if I had to write a rom-com, I, I'd have to do something similar to that. A parody it would just be gold. Yeah, the only reason I know about that is because some somehow with all my shit talking of Lifetime movies, somehow I got cast in a Lifetime movie. And, Wait, what? Yeah, you were cast in a Lifetime. When did this a, happen? This, uh, this Wait, happened, what? We shot we shot this in Minnesota uh, earlier this year, around the same time we shot Proof of Grey. And dude, some somehow this movie ended up on Lifetime. I guess they, I don't know how it happened, but is it is it good? It's uh, it's not a parody. It like it, it tries to be. It, it's basically like a typical Lifetime movie. It's it's called the Christmas Listing, and uh, my I remember my aunties. I didn't I didn't tell anybody anybody about it because I'm like I don't watch Lifetime movies. Who's gonna care about this? All of a sudden, my phone blows up and all these like aunties are like, yeah. Oh my god, yeah, you're in a Lifetime movie, and I'm like, What? Who who cares? And no, and no, I, the I, aunties I, care. Dude, the aunties, <laughs> the aunties got mad at me. They're like, "How dare you not Should, tell me? How how dare you not tell me? How dare you blaspheme the name of Lifetime in a world that is broken and corrupt and full of evilness? Lifetime movies are the only thing I can watch and feel a sense of peace in the world." Is uh, so. that that's how they feel but like lifetime is lightweight li- so lifetime is the place you go to find sanity and like good <laughs> values i never uh, thought about that about lifetime apparently I never, apparently I never had that opinion about lifetime apparently that's this is what uh this is what it is to them <laughs> lifetime and hallmark i i can't believe that exists i really can't believe that that exists <laughs> but you do that uh 
the KFC thing, the not, KFC, not your movie. The KFC, the KFC your movie, thing. I'm sure, is amazing. I'm talking about the KFC thing. The KFC that. thing is so good. I wish I could. That, it's so it's so freaking good. I hope they do more parodies. Um, do, do you wish that you were involved in the KFC mini mini movie? Dude, that would be as much as I love being code switched. If I could be in a friggin' KFC parody, that would that would be it. I'd have to hang up. I'd have to hang up my hoodie. That'd be it. You can't get any better than that. You you would retire. You just I, would, I have to retire. I can't, <laughs> you can't. You can't get any better than that. I could just imagine you on the poster taking Mario Lopez's place as Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Dude, I don't even need a beer. Just give me. A, just spray me with some spray paint. I'm good to go. This is gonna be a minimal budget. Dude, Mario Lopez is fantastic in it too. I'm sure. He's I wonder. I wonder. I just I just went to Ross this morning to buy some uh, uh, coconut water because they apparently they have gourmet foods, and uh, the entire like exercise area was just like Mario Lopez sponsored exercise equipment. It was like Mario Lopez uh, foam rollers, Mario Lopez jump ropes. I mean, this and man that just is, made you this... think of KFC the entire time. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> While you're, while you're on your workout, you're thinking about KFC the entire time. <laughs> but man, you got you got to add it to the top of your watch list. I don't know how long your watch queue is, but it it is it's rather long. Do you think I should just you bump off uh bump off the Queen's Gambit, bump <laughs> off uh, the f- finale of Better Call Saul. It's all about yeah. Oh yeah, get get all that out of there. Yeah, That's nothing the- compared to this. <laughs> Dude, my uh, just just my YouTube watch queue is insane. I can't my TV. Forget about my my TV watch. Like every time I'm on YouTube, every time I watch one video, I'm like adding four videos to my watch later. It's just I am I'm the same way. There's just there's just yes. so much quality content out there. There's just so much information that you want to learn because now because now it's like I can learn anything, anything I want to know. I can be like oh. I- there's so much out there. It's like, oh, I can know everything. Oh, oh my goodness. And then I'm just like, here's this video about philosophy. Oh, I'm going to watch this. And oh, yeah. here's, this, here's this about lighting. Oh, I'm going to watch this. Here's a, you know, a couple of interviews about of famous filmmakers. And like, oh, what kind of knowledge could they? You know, it's just like, I'm, I, am a, I am an information junkie. I definitely, that is definitely an appropriate name to call myself. Yes, absolutely. I mean, junkie is a strong word. I mean, do you get do you get like a uh, information withdrawals if you don't get enough information? I, like, you start getting yeah, mic- migraines. Yeah, like if I if I don't feel like I'm learning new things, I get really sad. Like, it is kind of like that's 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 an exaggeration. I don't get sad. I <laughs> I can be alone with myself and like be very at peace, but. Definitely with YouTube, just because there's so many stuff. And of course, they just keep catering to what you search. So like when you search a couple of stuff, they'll just be like, oh, you search this. Here's the next best thing that you that you might like. And it might give you something more. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, I got to learn whatever's in this thing. So in that way, I'm a junkie. If you have it lined up for me, I'm going to devour that. I'm going to I'm going to eat the whole plate. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Dude, this uh, this YouTube algorithm is getting like scary accurate now. Like, like, like I said, just in the span of me watching one video, I'll like check the thumbnails on the right and I'll click watch later, like four videos. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, all of these videos are so interesting to me, dude. I I'm checking my YouTube watch later queue right now. I have four thousand videos on there that I have to finish watching. I'm like four thousand videos I've added to watch later. It's just it's just madness. That's a lot of data YouTube has on me on uh, what well, yeah, I like to they, watch. They know almost everything about you. Let's be real; they know they know a lot about you by what you search. They know more about me than any human on this earth, <laughs> in, including myself, including including, including yourself. Yeah, I'm like I'm like I, yeah. That is, I actually like yeah. I would definitely want to watch the YouTube. You know, you dude, YouTube could. I could walk out onto the street. YouTube could somebody from YouTube could kill me. Easily replaced me by the next day, and and probably have a clone that, that they, yeah they they create that's a, better a, at imitating me than 
<laughs> I can imitate myself. And your family would be like at dinner with this clone and they'd be like, yeah, you know, you look great. You look great, <laughs> Steven. I, you know, this is amazing. I'm, I'm so glad that you came over and they wouldn't know. They have no idea. It's uh, that's, that's why I'm scary of uploading like my baby photos and my childhood photos to Facebook and Instagram. I'm like, and they just I'm remake like, you. I'm like, I'm, that's probably like the final step. And then Mark Zuckerberg has all he needs to just eliminate me, eliminate my whole carbon footprint. And then do you think Mark Zuckerberg me. wants to eliminate? Like, why would he want to eliminate Stephen George? Like, why? <laughs> I uh, I don't know. Maybe he's probably he's probably hearing me on the phone trashing him. He's like, okay, we gotta we gotta get only only my disciples. If you only my disciples, only can my survive. disciples, only those, which at this point is just like. 40 and 40 year old and older people who just love Facebook for sharing yeah, yes. Bible verses on there. That is true. The, the, it is definitely um, cons been consolidated by the boomers. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting now. I just realized is now that, you know, the, it's, it's getting later. Um, this light definitely looks way more sourcey than it did earlier. Now this definitely looks like I just got a light right here i don't mind yeah, i don't mind it's, it's it. not bad it's not bad it's not bad is it just one light source is it just that ring light well yeah i mean i mean the the natural light was coming in in front of me right and then i got this i got this ring light there you go is the do you have anything on the other side of you do you have like a mirror on the other side of you you're, i do have a mirror okay because i'm like you're you seem really well lit on the other side maybe the mirror must be reflecting the mirrors refract like yeah the That's mirror's what refracting some stuff okay it's got to be the mirror gotcha yeah I'm like, you look pretty well lit. Yeah, it's a little bit, it's not as perfect as it was, but it's still pretty good. It's it's just actually I could I could I could turn this down. <laughs> now, yeah, now you guys see the behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, it definitely looks like a light. <laughs> That's not, it's not bad at all. I mean, it, yeah, no, I mean it's still. You can still see me, so that's good, you know. Yeah. That's always how I judge, like, how it's going. Can they still see me? Yeah. Well, you know, this is what it is, folks. This is, <laughs> this is, how, this is how you're going to see me for the rest of the show. Can I, can I ask you something? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what... <laughs> the way you asked that now i'm a little suspicious I, yeah for a reason i got really like contemplative like oh man i gotta ask you know um you know there is this conception of actors comedic actors and dramatic actors that they're very, more so dramatic actors but just actors in general mm -hmm. um that they're insecure do you believe that to be the case and do you think that you need to be insecure to be an actor or is that not necessary Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I am on this podcast, the very first actor to reinforce every stereotype of, <laughs> of actors. We, Is that we, what you're about to do right we now? We are all insecure. We're all gay. And we're all, we all need to be coddled on set. So please, we only, no carbs, no nothing. No, I don't, that's a, that's a good question. Is that true? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't, from my experience, I don't believe that to be true. But then again, maybe the actors that I work with are better at hiding it than others. I don't know. That's tough. Um, that's so tough to say. Uh, I mean, the stereotype with comedians, they always say you you don't, people don't generally become, actually, you know, it's true for both comedians and actors. Often, I mean, there's the stereotype that you don't really become an actor unless you have this like dying need for attention and you probably didn't get that attention as a child. Mm -hmm. And now you're almost like stuck in this like permanent childhood and you're just trying to get that, uh, your validation from other adults. Um, right. There's, I mean, just is it, based is on there my truth, Is there truth to be said about that though? Based on my personal experience, it seems more true often than not. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably true for me more so than not. And I've had to reflect on that. Um, you know, 
Uh, I don't. It's not true for everybody, but I think for I think for the most part, it's more true than not. You know what I mean? Like like often, a lot of the comedians I know personally, many of them um, were bullied as mm-hmm. a child, and they found that comedy was the only thing that could get their bullies to stop pummeling their faces in. You know, just that self-deprecation would just be enough to diffuse the situation either at school or at home. It was always comedy that rescued them, you know, from the pits of uh, the worst of humanity. Um, yeah, it's, it's true. I'd, I'd say it's, at least for me, I probably went into it very insecure. I'm still, but I think I've, I think I've reflected on that. So it's not as much of the case for me, but I think, I think it is the case more often than not for actors. I mean, it it makes sense. And I mean, I am, I think I'm less insecure, but I'm grossly insecure. And I think that's what drove me to, when I was in high school, I acted in plays and like I did performances a lot. And I think the reason why I did that was, there's definitely a part of it was attention. Oh, yeah attention not that I wasn't getting attention at home but like just attention from people my age in general because I was weird and I thought very differently and I was you know introverted and more retrospective and reflective than most kids and I just like kind of stayed in my corner but there was a part of me that yearned to be noticed that something that yearned for acknowledgement um so I would I would just I would be crazy on stage. Like I would, I would just like, I would say, as you were saying, when, when we were talking about how you would go about certain lines with uh, code switch, I would say lines differently. If I thought I could get a better laugh, Mm -hmm. I would, you know, overdo things. Sometimes they were funny. Sometimes they were not like, I would just, but I realized, especially after all that, I was just like, oh, wow, you were just a kid that desperately wanted attention. Like, you just desperately wanted to be seen in that way. What, what was it that, um, was it you yourself that took the initiative to, to be in a play? Or was it your parents that are like, hey, you should try this. Maybe you'll uh, like it. It was, it was, I guess it was probably my parents. Yeah, like I think I usually, usually it is. Usually, yeah. Yeah, I think it was my parents. But you to... said you said you were introverted. I know. I remember my parents. Uh, one of my sisters was like very introverted, and my my parents were like, "Yeah, we should. Uh, maybe theater will kind of help her break out of her shell." Do you feel like that was? What do you think? What do you think it was that your parents uh, felt would be useful for you to do theater, or? Uh, play? Um... I think just my ability to communicate. I think yeah. that was important. Like my ability to just like not feel weird around large groups of people and it just express myself. And I and I and I definitely found that. And I also found, you know, a lot of friends through doing that stuff. And, you know, I initially went you know, because there was always in the back because I always I mean I I've adored television and movies my entire life and i always fantasized about taking this on i don't want to use taking this on because that sounds like a burden but no like actually like just doing this as my life um and getting invested in stories you know but but i i think i was insecure and i didn't fully think that that was possible so i thought well you know going to college i will uh i'll uh, i'll go into acting like I'll go into acting, I'll go, I'll do like theater uh, and then I'll get recognized maybe. And then I can maybe have the authority at that point to write something and then produce and direct and all that. Wow. And I, I only auditioned for one school, which was DePaul, uh, oh, the snap. DePaul Theater School. And uh, yeah, that, that can certainly tell you how committed I was to this, yeah. uh, to, to the acting specifically. Um and I, I did, I did the audition. And honestly, what I mean, the lead up was nerve wracking, but 
doing it was, I don't really remember doing it. Like it wasn't that cra- crazy to do. Like I just uh-huh. did it. And then, and then I got a call back and then I did that call back. And then I wasn't accepted to the school, obviously. Um, but I was able to do the callback, was a, which was a very interesting experience because we actually had the faculty like working with us. And that, that was interesting to see them do that. I, I could tell that even more so the, 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 the faculty members were not, they weren't necessarily, I mean, they were judging our ability to act, but they were more so judging the ability for us to respond to their criticism and respond to their way of teaching. Mm-hmm. And I think that's at, that actually, in retrospective, that did teach me a lesson about working with actors. Like their talent, of course, is incredibly important, but what's even as important, just as important is, do they, do they work with your style? Do they work with your way of communicating? Will they be open to it? And yeah. And then I did. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I didn't get the call back, but then, then my dad was like, you're into film and writing and why, why don't you do that? Like, why wouldn't you? And I was like, I mean, I want to do that, but I've never really thought like that could be a career. But then I went to the DePaul, I went to a, a conference where uh, Hollywood screenwriters and TV writers came in at DePaul. It's called Career 12. Okay. I've been there. I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so then I watched all these, you know, the, like the guy who wrote Die Hard and the guy who wrote Top Gun was there and they told their stories. And I was like, oh, this is doable. This isn't like a fantasy. This is like, yeah. you could actually, if you committed to getting good at this you learned how to do it you could you could do it like it's not it's not a fantasy it's not a magic trick um it's actually that that conference in that moment because i felt like that was a turning point moment that was um that's what inspired me to name this podcast career 13 because the font that you use when you're writing a screenplay is career 12 so i've had this as Courier 13. That's that's why this is, is, is it is it because your vision has worsened since then and you're like, yeah, I I want to write a 12, but I need to up the f- are you are you gonna rename it to like Courier 20 when you're like no, 40? That wasn't that wasn't my that's <laughs> that that wasn't that that wasn't my uh my my theory behind it. It was more so just like now it's getting really dark and it's snowing outside. It's crazy. Oh man, I don't have any windows in this room, so I have no idea. What it looks um like. it's actually snowing a lot oh uh, no it look it looks beautiful um but yeah no my my reasoning for it was just like it's it's uh that that uh you know just that title courier 12 means so much to me because i felt like it was a turning point so i wanted to like make a you know i want to change it up a little bit yeah and that's just cool call it this Curry Curry 13. But yeah, so um what were we talking about? Fuck, what were we talking <laughs> Where about? do we get uh, oh so why? Okay, yeah. So that's how I broke from the broke from my we were talking about like actors being insecure and stuff. Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. So I mean I think so I think that actors and filmmaker what i was trying to do i was trying to you know say that actors and filmmakers i think are the same in that way like they may a lot of them do start off by being insecure Mm -hmm. and not knowing how to fit in and trying to find themselves and it drives them to embrace art because that is a means of expressing oneself in a very profound way and 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 I, i had to go through that journey of dealing with my insecurity in order to get where I'm at now. So it was all, it all built up. It built up to this moment or to where I'm at currently. Um, I feel, I feel like that's, I feel like that's, that that's a good journey. Like you start off insecure, but then you find your place. And then through that, you transcend your insecurity and you become much less insecure. And then you realize your insecurities are just a, creation of your ego and they don't mean anything and your thoughts are just your ego trying to protect itself and you're like oh this doesn't mean anything yeah and, it, and yeah when you when you explain it that way it just it just sounds like every career path you know we're, just, we're always just so insecure 
in our teens and in our 20s, you know, and I think it's just as you get older, you just realize, uh, yeah, you know, I can do whatever I want. And yeah, it's weird. Life is like, there's this, you know, philosophy that nothing really matters in life. Um, and that could either be extremely motivating or it could be very demotivating, depending on how you look at it. Yes. And uh, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think I, I think it's motivating. Yeah, I kind of I kind of fluctuate with it. I kind of fluctuate between both, depending on how I'm feeling that day. But for the most part, I feel it motivating. I'm like, you know, if nobody, if everybody's so insecure about their own things, I don't have to trip about what I'm insecure about. Right? Really yeah. Cares. What are you tripping for? Right. Yeah. It's like you you feel free to do whatever because you know, like, no one's gonna stop me like it's like i can just do this like mm -hmm. why am i make why am i making this harder than it has to be just do it because it doesn't because when you make it up in your mind that like it matters so much it create it causes inaction that's at least that's what yeah. oh yeah, yeah. To me it makes yeah. you not want to do things because you think it matters so much mm -hmm. but once you let that go i'm not saying that you have to let it go to the point where you don't care about what you love and that you stop doing things all together but what i mean by that is you don't you know that it doesn't matter and that promotes you that drives you to be like or it convinces you rather that you that you can just do it just do it what are you waiting for just yeah. do it don't don't overthink let's just do i will say like like we've worked together twice already on two mm -hmm. different shorts yeah, I will say I went to the bathroom three times in the span of an hour just before we started recording this podcast. Uh -huh. It's like, like even I like struck. I'm like, oh, I feel I feel such a pressure to be insightful, and this podcast is going to be at, at least an hour long. I don't want to waste people's time, and I'm like, oh, right. You know what I mean? Are you like, you know, who who really cares? You know, we're just we're just chatting, you know. And uh, even even when you sent me the message yesterday. Uh, inviting me on the podcast i'm like my first my first has my first response was just the heartbeat like oh man oh. can i do this should i do this obviously yeah. i want to do it but mm -hmm. so what you know if i want to do it why not do it you know no i i think yeah no it, actually when when you're when you're like on the zoom call when your name pops up like oh can you admit this guy and i, I was like oh we're I, I, you know, I'm 14 episodes in and it still happens. Like I'm just yeah. like, oh, all right, now I got to turn on, I got to get ready. We got to hopefully make a show that, which is, again, it's just conversation, but a show that, and I have to, you know, during the conversation, steer it in a way where I'm getting the most out of your expertise. I'm, I'm trying to get the most out of the guest. Uh -huh. I'm trying to get the most out of what you know and what you you know, like who you are, like who you are as a person. I'm sure. trying to like discover that. So I'm trying to gear the conversation in a way that does that. Um, which I knew with you wouldn't be hard because you, when, especially when you open up, you have a very, you know, you have a lot to say and you have a very nice personality. Oh. Uh. Yeah, no, it's, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah, very, that's just, very sweet. Just being for real. Yeah, I mean, and, but that, but that's so good that even though you were like, you felt insecure a little bit at first, you were like, you know, but what do I got to lose? I feel like that's the point where you got to get, like, you got to get to a point where you're like, okay, I might, you know, there's this response in me, this physical response that I feel, I know it's, it's fear, but really, you know, isn't fear just anxiety or no, no, mm -hmm. it's, I'm sorry. Isn't fear just excitement? with a different, but with a different emotion that you tagged onto it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've been, I've been to so many actor workshops where they say that exact, that exact uh, statement. They're like, yeah, fear, fear is just excitement with the label on it. Yeah. That's all it is. Fear is a good thing. That means you actually care about it to have it. Right. Opinion. Right. Like when you felt fear, you were like, Oh, I genuinely, okay. He asked me to do this. I want this to be good. Oh, is this going to be good? Like, what do I have to do to make this good? And that's, Means you care, and I think that's an that's an an appropriate response. I think so, yeah. And then you you almost kind of have to not care. You have to you have to care until you actually. And once you're in it, you have to like just let go of everything. Yes. And, and not it's yes. You have to care, and then once you're doing it, not care. Yes, I mean I've learned that. I've had to learn that in many circumstances, but 
yeah, you have to you have to plan stuff out. You have to like prepare. But when the moment is happening, like when you're on set and you're directing a scene, you obviously prepare. You prepare your ass off. Yep. Lean up to the scene. But then once the scene happens, you gotta just let things happen as they will. Like you have to let the actors go in the direction that they're gonna go. If there's a problem, you have to you have to you can't just get resentful and wish the problem away. You have to go around the pro- problem and maybe that changes your plan, but you got to go with it. You have to adapt to the present moment at hand despite all the plan that you did. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, if if I don't yeah, if you saw the original Code Switch pilot like the, the reason why the performances are so stiff is because everyone cared too much in the moment. While while in the moment. Yeah. Um instead of just yeah, instead of doing what you just said. And uh, it, it, the writing is pretty decent, but it's just like, we just, we were, we were just way too in our heads. Yeah. No, well, yeah. Overthinking is the, is the enemy of authenticity. It's, it will cut down off authenticity like nobody's business. Yes, yeah, tough. I still, and I still kind of struggle with it, especially when I have like really big auditions. I still, it's, I'm like, Dude, I, I try so many different things to try to get my nerv- nervousness down. I do like breathing techniques. I'm like sniffing lavender like I'm a f- junkie. Man, no, I'm well, a... No, my... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, my, my girlfriend loves lavender, so I'm very into the lavender scent. So I, I, don't, I understand that. It's, it's tough. Som- and so- sometimes it seems like nothing works. And it's like, you just, I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Do you do you have, do you personally have any tricks that help you uh, kind of get into that Zen state when you're on de- set? Yeah, de stress. Well, you know, you know, honestly, I think having a lot of time to meditate is good. Meditating before you go on set is good. Yoga is good. I've been doing yoga recently. I love it. I love yoga. Go. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I will say just, just an even more general tip is just like, you have to disassociate from your thoughts. Like you have to, you have to understand that your thoughts and your, cause your thoughts are what fuels your ego and fuels the negative emotions in you. And then that makes them become physical. So what you gotta do is you gotta realize, oh, you are this vessel mm-hmm. of energy. I'm, I'm going to sound really trippy here, but I feel like this is very true. I'm in. I'm in. Okay. As long as you're in, <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> you are this vessel of energy, right? Because everything is made up of energy. Like energy, energy can't be destroyed. So even when something dies or something is destroyed, that energy is just transferred out into something else. Like it's just, you can't destroy energy. So you are this okay. vessel of energy. Okay. Okay. So have you ever heard of the, it's the, uh, this philosopher, the it's John Paul Satter, he's a French philosopher. His last name is well, it's, his name is John, then Paul hyphen Satter. So S A T R E. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But he he said this. He came upon this understanding that you know how uh, Descartes, the French philosopher, said, uh-huh. "I think, therefore, I am." Yeah. Well, he made a revision to that like idea. He says, the consciousness that says I think is not the same consciousness that says I am. So there's a part of you that's not just your thinking. Like there is this, like when people meditate and when they get into a really like meditative state where they're not thinking and they're just like in the state that people call presence, Mm -hmm. that's to me, that's the consciousness that says I am. Like I am just this thing made up of energy. And when you, when you're in that state, or at least when I've been in that state, you feel this great amount of peace and comfort and you realize that there's no obstacle and there's no thing that's going to come at you that's going to throw you off. And you're not so consumed by your negative thoughts anymore. And you just are, you just are you. And then when you get, then once you stop meditating or you stop and then you leave, 
you're reassured, like you understand that, like you leave in that. And then when like, say you're going to go into the audition, you know that I'm just going to be, I am more than just my negative emotions. I'm more than just my thoughts that fuel my negative emotions. I am also this powerful essence that is just me. Mm. And that gives me comfort and that, and that clears my mind and that, that allow, once I do that, that helps me, that allows me to take action. Like after I've done that, I don't overthink shit anymore. I just, I'm just like, okay, this is the present moment. What's going on? Okay. This is a problem. I need to act and do this to do that. Yeah. And then I just yeah. do it. And then yeah. you just like, you go in the audition and you're just like, oh, I got to do this. I got to present this performance. Mm-hmm. No more bullshit, no more overthinking, no more negative emotions. Just you are you do it. Like, yeah. I hope I explained that. Yeah, that was it. That was one in a coherent way. Like, yeah, that made zero sense whatsoever. That was complete. Uh, no, 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 that, that was good. It. I liked, I liked it. I was, I'm a fan. No, that, okay. That's, you're, you're a I fan. Get, I get it. I get it. I'll, uh, yes, yeah, I see where you're coming from with that. It makes like, sense. Like, are you into meditation? I um I do do yoga. Okay. Um a little bit. I only do you know like the downward dog pose and the uh I do I so I, I have like a I do like a little bit of uh physical therapy just to keep myself like an optimal physical shape. Not that I'm mm-hmm. an athlete or anything. I'm like, you know, I'm going on. And yeah. they make me they make me do some yoga poses every morning. So that helps a lot. Um uh like I, I was born, I was raised Christian, so mm-hmm. prayer has always been a part, which is all, which is almost like meditation, I think, in some ways. I think prayer. I mean, yeah, if if, if I think, yeah, if you grew up with that, I think prayer it can be a very meditative experience. Yeah, like yoga like I, is also a meditative experience. If you are like, if you focus on what you're doing, you know what I mean, and you lose yourself in it. Yeah, I don't generally lose myself. I'm, I usually have like a. I usually have like a comedy podcast on while I'm doing yoga. So maybe, maybe I'll try to, maybe I'll try to be more present in the yoga while I do it. It's, it's tough. Like, like you said, there's just so much information out there that you're, we're like always multitasking. Mm-hmm. So as I'm doing yoga, I'm also like watching a YouTube video or at least listening to it. And I'm like, you know, checking my emails at the same time because yeah. you, cause you, you're you're like it's like it's so you just you, you think about how like finite life is and like i have to be hyper efficient with everything i do with multitask which is which i know is not not really ideal you don't really want to multitask uh for the sake right. of like, your, your brain is health. there such a thing really as multitasking like you can switch rapidly between things but you can't uh-huh. actually do two things well at the same time yeah apparently not that's what I, that's what the, uh, that's what it sounds like, and it, and it always takes us way longer than you would think to sw- to get your mind to switch from one to the other. like. Even though you you even though you are rapidly switching from one to the other, you end up just being like you end up just like numbing yourself and just doing both half assed, yeah, and not really absorbing anything. Yeah. When you meditate. Like what, like when you get to like, when you feel most present, what does that feel like? Like, how do you, how do you explain how you feel when you meditate? I feel like the closest thing I've done to meditation is just controlled breathing for uh, several minutes. And Mm -hmm. when I do, when I do that, I just, I just feel, I feel like my body temperature has cooled down slightly Mm -hmm. and uh, my heart rate is, I, you definitely feel it physically. Like you almost feel chills. Maybe you're, I think you're just more, you're just better oxygenated, oxygenated. <laughs> you're just, you cause obviously you're taking these deep breaths in and your body's getting oxygen and, you know, deep, deep spots of the body. I don't know. I don't think I've really done like, I don't know. You, well, you said yoga is meditation. So I oh, guess it, it the, closest, the closest, yeah. the closest thing I've done to meditation is just deep breathing where I just feel a little bit chilled out. That's about it. Why? What about what about for you? I mean, well, you've you've already mentioned like the disassociative. Well, thing. I f- I feel yeah. like you you feel energy. Oh, you feel energized. 
I feel, yeah, well, it or depends. Ed- is that the same thing? Feeling energy and feeling energy? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I'm trying to explain this the best I can without. Yeah, it's like. When I used to when I used to do meditation, I used to just do like the mindfulness meditation, which is just like like whenever I would whenever I would sense my thoughts trail or whenever I th- could sense that like I was letting my mind race, I would then bring it back to the breath or refocus my attention on the sounds in the room or do something like that. Then I started getting into energy work, which is like you actually like try to feel the energy that's around you. And I used to think all of that was horse crap like i used to i used to think all that was dumb i was a complete skeptic but then i tried it and i was like what do you have to lose like if it doesn't work it doesn't work you don't get anything out of it and then you stop and then that's 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 all that happens but then i actually like took a class like i took a virtual class on it and it worked like it was like i could genuinely feel stuff like it wasn't like it wasn't and it's not like I'm not like shaking. Like it's not, it's a very gentle, like you just feel like yourself getting energized by the energy that's around you. And I think when, when, when I talk about like, when I spoke of like your presence and like being, uh-huh. that's what I think about. I think about the energy that's like in your body that you're made up of. And I, and once I did energy work, I could really tap into that and like feel that. Yeah. I want to, uh, I went to this place called, I think it's called the Sanctuary Yoga Studio or something with a couple of friends. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember the instructor, she was, uh, what was the name? Let me look it up really quick. Uh, the name of the class was called uh, Yin and Reiki or Riki. Yin okay. and, and I remember at the end of the class, my two friends, um, they mentioned, uh, so the instructor went around and she like, she said, you're going to, she said, she said, I'm not going to touch you. We've every, you know, cause of COVID mm-hmm, I'm not going right. to touch you, but I'm going to get really close. And you might, you might feel some uh, burst of energy. Just be ready for that. And both of my friends felt it. And I, and I went into it being so skeptical. I, I don't know if I just kind of stopped myself. Cause at the end of the class, I'm like, I didn't feel anything guys. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, I, I think there's something to be said about if you feel resistant to it and you're like and you're like feeling is like ah this is I'm not gonna because you know yeah, yeah I think, that was me. I think yeah, I th- I think there's I think you have to you know, you have to try your best, even if you don't believe in it, to like to be open to the possibility of it. Mm-hmm. Um especially with energy work because I definitely think that for some people it's it's harder to feel energy than others, especially if they're if they if they're like if they feel like it's definitely not gonna work. Um and I remember even the beginning when I started it. Like I, I would have episodes of it. And that to me it that confirmed it was real, but I wasn't completely there yet. You know, like it like I had to like ease into it like it wasn't like just this like immediate like oh yeah i completely get it now and this is how i feel all the time (laughs) Uh but i but i would get glimpses of it like there would be moments i'm like oh there's something here you know and i kept practicing and practicing it because i like oh i like how i feel when i do this or i feel better when i do this or when i get into this state so it it is a process It, it isn't for some people it might you know, especially if they're really open to it, it might happen quickly. And again, I'm not like an expert on this. So I don't want to like share information. Like it's like, that's like the totality. I'm just basing this off of what I've felt and from what I've learned from the people who have told me stuff. But if you're like, if you want to feel, if you want to like, if your if your goal or something is like get more present with yourself and like decrease anxiety and get more like within yourself, Mm-hmm. I feel like energy work is a great tool for that. Yeah. All right. I mean, I guess I, I guess I'll give it another shot. Um, this this class you took is that is that what really felt like that was like your entry point into really yeah it was it was this point? Mind Valley course it costed like I did like a two payments and it was all together like two forty nine or something okay um. You can you can find it if you search it out. But if you don't want to pay, I'm sure that there are YouTube videos for free 
where yeah. someone can walk you through it and you don't have to pay for it and that would be good what do you think i what do you think i should look up on youtube if i want to just kind of i've actually never looked it dip up my on YouTube. feet into it um i would say just look up energy work i would look up grounding with grounding. your root chakra okay i would start i would start learning how to do that because that is very that's a very helpful skill okay because that grounds yourself it makes you feel like present in your body yeah yeah and you feel much more calm and at peace yeah my friend he also took a he also went to an online class where he had to practice breathing techniques mm -hmm. uh it was called what was it called the art of breathing or the art of living hold on i think it's the art of is it a book or is what it, it uh, sounds like a book title yeah it does sound like a it is a book i'm trying to remember but I remember he paid like several hundred dollars and then and then we looked it up on YouTube and it's like, yeah, that's 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 the, the same stuff he did in the class was on YouTube. But he, he's he's still glad he took the class, though, because it kind of helped. Yeah, he probably got a very expansive view of it. Mm -hmm. And I, also, when you pay for something, it makes you more invested because you've invested like you've like you've literally invested in it. So like you're definitely yeah. going to take it very seriously and pay attention to it. Mm hmm. But yeah, I again a lot of these teachings and a lot of this stuff and like books and stuff is on YouTube. So again, if you if, sure. you, if you're like I don't want to spend the money, you can find ways to learn without. And I, obviously with COVID and stuff, I get that it's you want to save money, and you know people are struggling. <sighs> yeah, COVID. That that that's a topic that we could discuss, but I don't know, <laughs> but what more can be said about that? Like honestly. I feel like I'm going crazy with that with that one. Just like I still I still for I went to the gym a few days ago and I and I forgot to wear my mask again. I just I just went to the front desk. I'm like, hi, how are you doing? And she just stares at me. She goes, I'm mm. like I ran back to my car and then just, I'm like, man, it's you know, it's been it's been over nine months now and it's sir I don't know, it's weird. It's gonna be a year soon. I mean, in like February. I mean, I know the vaccines are, I mean, I know people who have gotten the vaccine, so that's great. Like we're rolling right. that out, but like when all the vaccines are distributed, it'll be like a year. Which is a while, but also extremely impressive with what humanity has been able to accomplish to have a, va a, to have a, right, to have a vaccine that two. long and, or yeah. that for that, for, like in that short of a time. Apparently right. they said like vaccines have never been developed in shorter than like, what was it, like five years or something? prior to the COVID vaccines. Um, like apparently, I don't even know if, uh, like like the, I remember when Ebola came out and uh, people were like, yeah, the vaccine should come out sometime. And this was like back during Obama's presidency when Ebola was an issue. And uh, the first FDA approved vaccine for Ebola just came out last year. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that was at least like four or five years for Ebola. So. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there there was such an incentive to get that out. Like, everyone was like, "Please, we'll pay you whatever. Like, make this thing <laughs> now. Get it out now." But, yeah. but I, I think what, what I mean, at least I had heard this, right? I saw this, like, because SARS was such a big thing, and SARS, I believe, it's because the SARS virus is. Either SARS as a virus is kind of related to COVID. They're like kind of made up the same way, like biologically. Oh, sure. Yeah. They yeah. were able to build off of that or just because the devastation of SARS, like there was just a lot of like research that was done on vaccines. So by the time COVID hit, we, it still took us like some time, but we were able to make breakthroughs much quicker, a lot faster yeah. with that. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully these other vaccines that are being developed in Russia and other countries, hopefully. I know, I know uh, with India, they're not going to be taking um, the American vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna. I think they're planning to take the Russian vaccines. And I, and I know a lot of Indians that just have no trust of Russia in general. They're like, oh, no, we're good. We're just going to, we're just going to drink our turmeric teas and hopefully we'll... Uh, Keep the immune system strong. That yeah, way. I mean, turmeric's great for that. Um, <laughs> but like, 
Yeah. No. I mean, I thought. I mean, I thought that the U.S. was going to ship it all over. I, mean, I, th- I think it's rolling. Maybe I don't know. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's, I mean, it's just breaking news every hour. So it's that probably is the case at this point. Who knows? That's that's me regurgitating news from a couple of weeks ago. So that might be the case. Yeah. How yeah, many times t- have you been like living your life during this time and you've forgotten that the vaccine or, you know, you've forgotten that COVID was a thing? It's, um, I think pretty much any time I've like watched television um, or movies that have come out before 2020, like, like with COVID, we're watching, a, we just have, especially with COVID during the holidays, we just have time to get down or watch cute. And I, I was watching uh, just shitty Christmas movies and television and seeing large crowds of Christmas parties and concert scenes. And I'm like, yeah. And you just get totally sucked in and, and then you leave your house and everybody's got masks again. And it's, it's like, whoa, re- real life almost feels more like a movie than, than these Christmas movies I'm watching. So yeah. I, I can definitely attest to a very to very similar experiences. Like when you're watching stuff that clearly you feel, oh, this is definitely even even if it were just a few years ago, you feel like, oh, I feel like I'm being transported back. And I guess that's, you know, one of the amazing things about movies is you you feel like you're watching an imprint of a time period. Even if it was just like a year ago, <laughs> a period piece, <laughs> period piece, but it's like 2017. <laughs> but sometimes you watch it and you almost get triggered. You're like, there's, there's, there's 20,000 people in this arena. No one's wearing masks. You're all going to kill yourselves. It's, it's weird. It's, yeah. You know, you're, you're like, why aren't you guys what? like being safe right now? What is this? Somebody report this. I, Somebody I was, I was do watching, something. I was here. watching like, like NBA highlights from last year. And I'm like, oh my gosh. How did what they are happen? these people happen? doing? But then you're like, oh, there was no need to. <laughs> yeah, it's it's truly nuts. It's like even though we haven't seen each other since January, it's like we we just have we just have, even though we're so isolated from each other, we've just experienced so much of the same things, which is like very bonding. Just which is pretty which is pretty yeah. Cool. You you gotta have empathy. I mean, this this has to. I feel like this experience has to promote expansive empathy between us i mean i hope i mean i know we're still uh, divided because of politics but like which is, which is silly um how we're, how much we're divided mm-hmm. but you gotta think when all is said and done and, and when you reflect back on it we all have gone through this how can you not empathize with even someone who you completely like have a different experience than like it's I think that'd be very sad if we if that didn't happen. Like if we didn't have that occur. Yeah. You know. It seems it see it almost seems like it's been dividing us more than it's been bringing us together with all the arguments over having to wear masks or not and just seeing all the fights on live leak of like people punching like Julep Osco employees for making them wear their masks. I don't know. I I feel like I feel like I've become a lot more gentle with people because I know everybody's going through a tough time right now. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it is. I don't know how much it's brought us together or not. It, it seemed for a moment that we were, were that we were going down that direction. And I mean, I know this has been said many times before, but right when the quarantine was happening, when when the initial lockdown happened, it felt like people were coming together because we were all forced to get together. We had to reflect about our lives and what we were doing and how we were treating one another. But then, you know, because of Trump being in office with the George Floyd Mm -hmm. tragedy, then everyone was just like, oh, fuck everybody else. And unless they, you know, are like me, you know what I mean? Like we Mm -hmm. got tribal again. And I was like, damn, that was a great opportunity. And I hope, and I do hope, not that I'm saying, I, again, I mean, the George Floyd thing, the George Floyd tragedy illuminated many things to us, again, that needed to be illuminated. So, 
you know, we had to learn from that. But man, there was an opportunity there. And I and I do think that it that it will come back, that we will, you know, we will when this is all said and done, there will be a massive mourning for everyone that we have lost. Like, and you know, a mm-hmm. confirmation that, oh yeah, we all went through this together. Wow. You know, and, and Americans will hopefully come together again. That's my hope. Hopefully. At least. Yeah. It's just it just kills me. Every time I go on social media and I just see people yelling at each other. It's like you're not gonna change anybody's mind by yelling at them. No, you're yeah, you won't. Gonna, just, you they're won't. Gonna, they're, they're always gonna double down on their beliefs. Yeah, no. If you if you come at someone combatively, they will they will return combatively because you're protecting your ego and they're protecting their ego. Like yeah, like you like if you if both egos come together and try attacking one another, that it will just continue to fuel that. Like they like you have to you have to come from a place of of empathy and a place of of level headedness mm-hmm. and i don't even know do what. you have uh do you have any like friends from two completely separate circles and you care about them deeply but you, um, you know they would never get along with each other uh maybe like i don't know I feel like I have a lot of those friends. I, I mean, I, I have loved ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love, yeah, it could be loved ones, family, friends. Yeah. Like, I, I, I have people, I mean, I know people who I care about dearly who, who I mean, like, if I put them in a room with another loved one mm-hmm. that I hold dearly, like, they would be, you know, and they really, and they, and they fully invest in their egos and their political beliefs. They would, yeah, they would, they would go ham. Um, but I don't, I love both of them the same. Like it's not, yeah. I don't, cause I know that, I know that neither of them are being dicks. Like none of them are actually like terrible people and want it. And none of them actually want to do any harm to anyone else. Mm-hmm. You know, no, none of, no one like, I know this, this should seem obvious, but not every, like I'm, I mean, I'm a Democrat, but not mm-hmm. every Republican is a racist. Yeah, a and lot I know, of yeah. I know. I know a lot of a lot of well-minded, well-intentioned liberals like to think that, and it, uh-huh. it, it's easier for them to label people that way mm-hmm. because for for the ego, for the mind, it's easy to do that, and it thrives off of that. Yeah, the whole tribalism thing. But it's not. It's not truthful. There's, there's no truth in that. Like that's. Yeah. I mean, are there Republicans who are racist? I'm sure. I mean, oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not even like that's not even a quite like yes, like yeah. On both on both sides, there's plenty. Uh, they're right. But are there people. Democrats who are very ill-informed and racist? Oh yeah. Uh, yes, I've met some. Like it happens. Like it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're all individuals. Um. So like, it it does disturb me. How, we will label people things because of one element of their belief system or their ideology or their character. Well, character, you should judge people on their character. If someone, <laughs> if someone's like being an awful, yeah. judge them and tell them that they're being wrong and don't condone that, you know, when it comes to your character and how you treat others, that matters. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 it's i just i just think people i just think what's sad is that there's a lot of well-intentioned people that are so invested in their self Mm -hmm. like i know a lot of people who i would call you know liberals progressives and they're very and they want to do and they want to do right in the world and they want to do great things but they'll also treat other people like shit and then i'm like where's your character then yeah if you're being a dick to these people who aren't who may have different viewpoints, but are not like trying to do harm or cause harm or to others. If you're just being a dick to them, what? Like you're then aren't you just the dick? Aren't you just the antagonizer then? Aren't you just Yeah. And of course we're gonna disagree and and there's debates should be had, like serious debates should be had. But if we forget that we're humans and that we are all 
connected to each other and we have that bond, then we're not we're not we're not being what we should be. We're not acting as we should. Yeah. Well said. I, I didn't mean to I didn't mean to <laughs> I mean every, but every, I'm hopeful. Every, but every, I'm hopeful. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Every every conversation I've had it's it's you know I'm I'm pretty impressed. It took us about two hours to get into politics, but it, that's pretty good. That's probably well, we, the longest. We, we, had, we had a lot more other important stuff to talk about <laughs> than that. <laughs> this is kind of this is this know, is every con- this is every conversation. It's you know it's gonna come up. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's you know it's at the top of our minds all the time. It's you can't really ignore it. Yeah, but that but you gotta realize though that it, honestly, it doesn't matter as much as you think it does. At least that's my opinion. Like, it does matter, but like, and maybe this is just my viewpoint, and maybe because of my privilege. I mean, I know that I'm privileged in many ways, so maybe I can view my reality this way because of that privilege. But How much did it matter if Trump won or Biden won? Like, how much did it matter? Uh huh. You're both getting very egotistical old men. Mm-hmm. One's just one's presenting themselves one way; the other one's presenting themselves in another way. And one of them used to present themselves the other way. You know, Trump. Yeah. Trump used to be a Democrat. Well, yeah, and I mean, Biden. And it was just it was just convenient for him to have, present himself the other way. Have you seen the video of Biden literally using the N word during a committee hearing? I don't think I have, but I'm not surprised at all. No, like I actually I saw that video after the election, and it made me like rethink like what I did. Oh boy, it made me be like, oh. But then again, it's like, what what was the difference? Mm-hmm. Like, what was the massive difference between your choices? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's it's tough, and I think um, I think at least for the I f- it feels like the last several elections, everyone's always voting against instead of voting for the candidates. Yes, yeah, that that's a huge thing. That's a huge thing. You know, like I know I know a lot of uh, Republicans that they voted for Trump even though they strongly dislike trump but they're like yeah we know we gotta we gotta get more of our people in the supreme court and we gotta well yeah i think the political parties bank on that like they bank on the fact like we don't have to give you a candidate that's gonna make policy or make your lives better we just gotta make you hate the other side so much that whoever we put up you'll have to go with them because you are afraid of the other guy or the other person you know Mm-hmm. And I think if we if we know that and people recognize that, then we're not going to be duped, and people will then have to demand change. Um, maybe a third party will emerge. Maybe we'll just say, you know, we will just not, you know, we'll just. It's it's funny because what would have to happen is, like one party would have to decide, man, the candidates that you give us are so bad, we're just never going to vote, and the other party will just continue to win, and that then that party would have to adapt. You know what I mean? Um, like that's the only way you, would have, you could incentivize them to do it. I can't imagine that happening. I mean, it, it would work. It, maybe, I mean, maybe. If, you, if you kept doing that, it would work. Okay. Like, if one... You know what I mean? Like... If say, I'll just pick the Democrats, for example, say yeah. if the Democrats were like, man, we don't like Biden. We don't like any of these people that you're throwing up. They don't represent our values. We're, we're going to vote for the Republican because maybe there's an issue that we agree on the Republican, you know, on this value. And then the Republicans will accumulate those voters. And then that party, the Democrat, or it could be reversed. I mean, it could be the Republicans say who the Republicans are like, we'll just vote Democrat. Then that would force the part would be like, God damn, we gotta actually like, we got we gotta put something someone up who's great, yeah, and you're like it's gonna change some stuff. Like we actually have to like be populist. I yeah, that would be 
That would be so entertaining to watch. That would be very hard. It would be very hard to convince. I can't imagine that ever happened, especially with record numbers of mm-hmm. voters to let with the 2020 and 2018. I just, I can't imagine that happening. But that, I, I mean, yeah, I could see it working. I think what's more likely is that that a third party would have to emerge. Mm-hmm. But even then, that would that's going to take some time. You the know. one the one exciting thing that happened in um I believe it was twenty yeah, twenty twenty, uh was was the state of Maine introducing ranked ranked choice voting in their state, which uh, which gives like a third party at least some more fighting room. How does uh, that work? It's um I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I know um citizens of Maine are like extremely happy because now it's they don't they're not they're not just voting for two parties. They're basically just uh ranking their choices. Um I'm going to be I'm so terrible at, it, at even explaining this, but basically, basically it's just like one of the quickest and easiest ways to get a third party um to have somewhat of cuz you know at, when everybody votes, nobody wants to waste their vote, so they always vote for one of the two top parties. Um in Maine at least with you ranking your choices, um, you are voting for more than two choices. So the third party has, a, you know, at least a chance and at least they hear, get their voices heard. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I'm adjusting this light. <laughs> oh, yeah, the yeah, sunset, baby. Sunset. Oh, should I put on like a, a warmer tone? Yeah, let's go, go for it. We can, we can change this to... Oh, that's really bright. Sorry, it's just something. <laughs> this is my first time. It looks good, man. Oh, oh, oh! Got a little bit of a. Now you look like you got a color grade going on with the blue. Yeah, I feel like apocalypse now. Damn. Like, I don't know. I don't know, man. Damn. Just like but, that. But no, that's. I'm sorry. Courier 13, directed by Michael Bay. <laughs> now you got to change your uh, theme song to just feature an explosion every every other beat. You could probably hire somebody in Fiverr to do that. Just, you know, pay them 10 could. bucks. I probably could. And just yeah. go over the top with explosion noises. Yeah. But I... Yeah, politics is strange. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, I tried. I tried my best to avoid talking about it with with the holidays, but that was a futile effort. Uh-huh. It was futile. I try to try to stick to the board games. You're like, come on, guys! I know half of us voted for Trump and half of us voted for Biden. Let's not. Let's not. And then it is happened. it like split fifty fifty with your family? It's, like. With with my family, it's it's pretty close to evenly split. Um, yeah, yeah, which is really tricky. Yeah, man. How about how about your family? It's it's the same. It's the same. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult to <laughs> navigate that. For sure, I don't even know what to say about that. I don't even know what like what advice to give about that because I don't really know how to deal with that. Like, yeah, um, like it's easy for me when I talk to kids and I see them disagree. I feel like they're impressionable enough. I'm like, come on, kids, you can listen to each other. You know, just because you guys disagree doesn't mean you can't respect each other. And the kids are like, yeah, okay, but it's, it's just you know, with adults and the way our brains just lose their liquidity and you just it just feels like it's just so much more work with them. But so, uh, one, a friend told me that it, you, it takes something like 21 separate instances to get somebody to warm up to a new idea. Really? So, something like that. Something insane. Really? Like, I yeah, did not know that. I way higher than I expected it to be. Wow. So just the amount of patience that you would need for to accomplish getting somebody to, 
consider changing their views is tough. I which which seemed really high to me. Like I feel like I'm always changing my mind on different things. Well, I definitely so. think that. Have you ever taken like the personality test that rates you on like openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, um, extrovert, and like there's there's another. Is that the is that the, the is that the four letter test? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think I have wrong. taken I've I've taken something similar to that. Yeah, right. I think uh, and I think this is true for a lot of artists. A lot of artists and a lot of thinkers in that realm, like they're they score very high in openness. Okay. Because I definitely feel like there are people who are more open than others. Like yeah. they can they can take in new ideas and new ways of thinking better than other people. Mm-hmm. So I do think there's a difference, but that is interesting. You say 21 times. I feel like it doesn't take me 21 times to be introduced to a new idea. Well, maybe because when you think about it, I watch so many, I watch so much stuff and I, I'm constantly reading and stuff like that. So maybe that's why it seems quirky to me because I'm constantly examining the information you know oh sure through multiple means like multiple medias you know yeah yeah i don't know i don't know what are you looking at right now i'm uh, i'm just i'm just googling um i i was googling 21 times new idea to try to see if i could find like some like scientific proof but i'm not finding it it's there's this one article that says it takes it's addressing the myth that it can take 21 days to form a new habit um but they're they're arguing against that myth they're saying um oh this 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 article says it takes on average 66 days for a new behavior to become automatic how many days? 66 days, just over two months for a new behavior to become automatic. That makes sense. I get that. But I don't know where that, uh, I don't know where that 21 day or the 21 times um, came from. We just, the thing with all this information is just so hard to filter what's accurate and what's not accurate. I'm yeah, curious. I don't know. I'm curious about this because you are an actor. Uh huh. How have you been surviving with COVID? Like, I you know we talked about COVID, but like, how have you gotten get? It's like, what's the audition process like? How do you get work? Yeah, it's um, it's been it's been fun, man. It's I mean, pretty much everything is self taped nowadays. Um, is that awkward? Like, I would find that to be very awkward. Like, I think, I think most of us hated it initially, but we've gotten kind of used to it at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, like I basically have two tripods right next to me. Like I'm, you know, and, uh, you're just ready to go. And whenever I, someone gives it, you a call, it, send it me a tape, happen. let's go. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm definitely getting, I'm pretty much getting the same amount of auditions now as I have pre COVID. Um, and that's because casting directors can audition more people with self tapes they can just say yeah yeah send me a self tape and you know they don't have to they don't have to sit in the room and watch actors five minutes at a time they can quickly click through self tapes and maybe watch like five seconds before moving on to the next person well that's that's interesting because it's both an advantage and a disadvantage to you it is yeah because like the advantage is you're you get more opportunities because more you can more cat you the casting director can see you you can mm-hmm. see more people true but you got your odds are so much yeah the odds right are- well and you got to make sure that your tape interests them from the get go yeah like you can't or at least in you know you can't dilly daddle which kind of sucks because you can't like get into a performance like mm-hmm. you know what i mean you have to like yeah, you're you're almost just win like, them over right then and there. Yeah, you're almost like, oh, how do I stand out? Should I go against the grain? Should I do something that's really risky? All right, like how do you get their their attention? Is that's yeah the question. You know, sometimes you wonder like, sometimes you wonder, am I just like the diversity? Do they do they just need like a quota of like 
like I like I recently auditioned for like a 55 year old like grocery store uh cashier and I'm like are they just gonna see my thumbnail and just be like no nah, he's too young next so right. and I'm like and it took me and it took me like an hour to self-tape that because I take I do so many takes and try to get the perfect take so it's it can be it's tough you, um it can it can be both disheartening because you're like oh they're probably not gonna even watch this but at the same time like I've gotten uh, auditions with certain casting directors that I've never gotten the opportunity to audition with before. Um, what, hopefully, I made a good impression with them. But we'll more see. casting directors know who you are. Yeah, that's that is. There a you pro. go. Yeah. So that is that is a pro. Um, in terms of what's shooting nowadays, um, it's mostly like non-union commercials. Uh, just just a couple of weeks ago, I was. Uh, I basically spent six hours with a can of corn in my hand, just going up and down on my tippy toes, just like oh this. Oh my gosh. For six hours straight. The stuff that's, that you do uh, as an actor sometimes. That's, yeah. Cause you know, cause you, you don't, you never want to say no to your agent, you know, cause your agents are constantly hustling for you and submitting you to stuff. And you're like, yeah, I guess I'll do it, you know? And uh, yeah, I, that was a, that can was a, we can we see this corn commercial? Is this... I I don't know I don't know if it's come out yet. Uh, many times with commercials they don't really send you the footage. You just many times it's just like a friend. It's like oh I saw you in this thing and then you're like oh that's cool. I'm glad. Thanks for sending it to me. When does that happen to you? Uh, with uh almost all, pretty much all the time with commercials they almost they pretty much never send you um, the commercial clip. I mean, sometimes you can like email somebody on the crew and be like, "Hey, can you give me a heads up on when on where the commercial will air or when it'll happen?" And uh, yeah, so many times I've just had to, I've like seen a commercial, and then I just have to like download it. <laughs> I've had to, I've had to illegally like torrent, like like I have cable and I have like Netflix, and I'll and I'll have to like download and you, but you can't really download episodes of netflix you have to like torrent it just so you can have that clip of yeah. yourself so it's yeah it's acting is acting is fun like so from it seems from, from your perspective that you know it's it's different but you, actress can still find stuff like it's not like a barren wasteland and, sh and people are still shooting you know what i mean like yeah yeah they're still shooting it's just um generally the shoot dates or at least the shooting days makeup takes like way longer mm. like like if they if they do put makeup on you like uh a recent shoot i had um they first of all they just can't have as many many people at once so they're like working on one actor at a time applying makeup and they're like yeah we need your mouth closed so can you apply your own makeup so they're like they'll like make me go to the bathroom and i'll like apply the They'll like, they'll like be in the doorway and tell me how to apply the makeup, and then I like look to them like, is it good? And like, yeah, no, take that <laughs> off and fix it. And, and you it, gotta do your makeup, wardrobe, all that stuff. Like you gotta. Yeah, you pretty much bring your own wardrobe uh, nowadays. Um, at least for commercials nowadays, they're often looking for um, actors who live with family or roommates and they'll br and they're much more open to bringing in non-actors because they want to generally bring in quarantine pods mm -hmm. um, to audition. At least that's the case for like a lot of uh, commercials. Um, Wait, like ex I, explain that to me. So, so I can, let me show you. So least, if you're like a group of actors living together, they, they like that because then they can bring you all in, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. It can also be family members that audition because they they live with you. It depends. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes commercials are, especially if the commercials are non-speaking and you don't really need that much acting skill. Mm -hmm. Like I just got an audition. This was yesterday um, for some like hospital commercial. And they're basically like, hey, Steven, um, we need you to send an audition for this. Um, it's got to be with people that you live with. We're, we're basically casting a group of two to three friends in this mm -hmm. hospital shoot commercial. Obviously, we know you're an actor, but we uh, we only want you aud to audition with people that have been in the same COVID bubble as you. Uh, so that's that you're seeing a lot more of. 
Um, really? Real families, real friends. That's cool. It's cool, but you know, my family doesn't want to audition. <laughs> They're like, or, no. Or my, thank my, you. Yeah, basically, yeah. A lot of my friends and families are non actors. So uh, at least, you know, so it's. So those ones I turn down generally, but yeah. I've, uh, every time I've auditioned for like one of the Chicago shows, dude, th- these Chicago shows have been in hiatus like three times already this winter. Uh, like Chicago Fire, they, uh, I think their season started in, was it like September? Mm-hmm. And then I got an audition and then I submitted it. And they're like, hey, Steven, actually, somebody on the crew got COVID. So the whole production is shutting down. And then, and then they'll come back like a few weeks later. And then you'll get another audition for the next episode. They're like, hey, actually, another person got COVID. So we're going to be back in January now. What show so. is this? It's basically all the Chica- uh, Chicago oh, Fire, the Chicago, Chicago Med, right, Chicago, Chicago Fire. Yeah, because they tried, but then. They tried, but, you know, they just have. Yeah. They're, I think they're like testing crew every single day. And the moment somebody gets COVID, it's just the whole thing shuts down for like a couple of weeks. I've never asked you this. Are you on? Were you ever on one of those shows? Like as a guest? Or Dude, like a- I've auditioned i think it's been what like 20 times now for those shows it's been so many times and i'm always like i'm always getting like director callbacks and i'm like and i'm like putting put on hold but it hasn't happened yet you're gonna get it when when the next time i think so what i i would i i think so i yeah it's like it's like one of those like birthrights almost for chicago actors like almost every chicago actor eventually gets on one of those shows is well i mean it is great to have that there like to have it i mean i know obviously you know when you're in chicago you're 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 a little uh disconnected from la and los angeles and that stuff but here you do have that there there is a place where they have the chicago shows and they filmed well it's the cine space which is where they where they shoot that mm-hmm. you know they also had empire there like mm-hmm. they have other shows there too so I mean, I'm glad that it's not like as bleak as I thought it was for actors. Like, it seems like from what you're telling me that it's not that terrible. Yeah, Chicago Chicago is one of the strongest commercial markets in the country. Um, so you can make a living just doing commercials, um, even now. Um, and yeah, Chicago has probably like, on average, 2020 was kind of a rough year for Chicago, uh, obviously. But I think in like 2019, I think there was like, what, like a billion dollars or so in just put in productions. I think there were like close to like 20 shows. Yeah. Like Fargo shot in uh, this last year. Um, a lot of really cool shows. Like I, audi- I auditioned for Fargo as like some, as, as a doctor. <laughs> and it was, uh, man, Fargo is, it's like, one of the, it's like one of the weirdest scripts I've ever read. Like none of the lines, like many times with scripts, like the lines logically make sense, but the writing with Fargo is like so quirky. You almost, you almost, it's yeah, it's which is cool. That's some some of the best writing that, is yeah. some of the best writing is like that, where it's where the writing is so unpredictable, and uh, the characters are not really totally addressing each other, like yes. a natural conversation. Right. Because they 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 have such a personality that's so eccentric and so in your face that it's just like they're going on, on their own tangents and they're they don't even care about having a coherent sentence yeah or a coherent conversation which is 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 indicative of life i mean you i've definitely have conversations where the other person doesn't care what i'm saying oh man More they just want they just want to say whatever they want to say and that but that's real that's real though mm-hmm. yeah i'm glad though i'm really glad to hear that it's like you're doing okay like i thought yeah she was gonna yeah. be bad like <laughs> <laughs> so like how how the so the sets have been okay well you talked about like doing your makeup and stuff but do you think like chicago has done a, a decent job of you know having covid precautions and shooting you know shooting but also being safe do you think they do i mean job? chicago's been way safer than la i mean uh the government in, L- in la was like yeah Basically, film workers are considered essential workers, so we're just going to keep shooting over here. Chicago has been like way more um, careful with uh, the moment somebody gets COVID on set, it's like, all right, production postponed. See you all in a couple of weeks. Everybody get tested. Everybody stay safe. 
So which you know, I can respect that. But 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 there's still a lot of opportunities though. Like it's not like everyone's just shut down. Yeah. 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 For the yeah for the, it's just it's it's kind of tricky. Many times you audition for something, and they just don't have any dates. They're like, yeah, mm-hmm. we have this audition. Uh, you don't have to send us your uh, availability because it's probably gonna shoot sometime in the next two months. Just yeah. Like, We'll, we'll, let you know. we'll let you we'll know. We'll let you know. Oh, things. also, also, could you keep your schedule open for these three weeks in January? Because <laughs> it'll probably would be one of those dates, but we don't really know. And so, yeah, just yeah, we're gonna keep all two hundred of you actors. Just keep your keep your schedules open for those three weeks. Don't go out of town. Just uh, hang tight. It's it's pretty nuts. Yeah, yeah. No, it 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 has been. It's been nuts, but I am glad that people are still acting in whatever capacity that they can. That's yeah, that's really important to me. Absolutely, man. It's uh, entertainment's been a huge reason why we, why we've been able to cope with COVID, and that is gl- true. Glad, glad it's still being made. In Indian uh, TV is so funny. Many times you'll watch like a like a Bollywood show, and they're they're just they're just wearing masks in the scene. Yeah, and, just, and during the soap operas, this. with it's just, it's so friggin' funny. Oh, it's yeah, you know there. I mean, there are some shows that are just so playing into the whole COVID thing because they're like, how can we ignore this? Like, let's just let's just go full blown COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. but no, like, I know how like crazy that 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 whole LA thing, like being like essential workers thing, but I think it's kind of true. Like people who make entertainment right now, you kind of are essential for our sanity. Like we are essential to the general collective sanity of this society that we're in, that we are a part of. Yeah, I would think so. I do have to head out in about uh, two minutes. Two. Well, I, listen, I, man. I, no, this is a, this is a good place. Yeah, I think this is, to, this is good. Yeah. Then, like, this I has think been so a great conversation, man. I'm so glad that I. Did that I decided to reach out and we 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 did this. I, I love this. Huge huge honor to be the first actor. Yes. Hala. Hala. Listen, man. Um, before you go, like, I just want to say it's been amazing talking to you. I really enjoy talking to you. So thank you for that. You um, as well, my man. Um, everyone, please check out Code Switched. You can find it on YouTube. Um, I'll put a link in the description to the channel um like to the place where you can find all the episodes it's really funny you're you steven are really funny in it uh people everyone's good the actors are great uh please everyone check it out so where can people find you before we go uh you can find me on uh, sometimes i ask my guests this question sometimes i forget but i want i want people to know where to find you you can find me on among us I uh, I play the Spanish version of Among Us because uh, I because I play video games, but I like to be productive, so I practice my Spanish on there. Oh, that's hilarious! I, uh, my avatar's name is Pastor Bert because I met this goofy Filipino pastor in my college years, and I named my character after him. So if you get killed by somebody on Among Us in the Spanish version, that's me. Uh, uh, <laughs> social media, I'll post like a funny. St- story once in a while on instagram so what's your instagram feel free to be friends with me on there it's just uh it's just my name steven z george steven z george steven z george so yeah and uh that's about it really well steven thank you so much again for everything uh i love this this was great this is fun man all right hope you have a uh Merry New Year. And, and a Merry uh, New Year to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm like I can like it's weird. I'm like I'm like seeing myself the whole time and I just Christmas is still in my mind. Yeah. This 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 gotta go. <laughs> Christmas is over. I gotta put it, I gotta put in my I'm glad you did now. that. That was bothering me the entire time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um but yeah, happy new year, man. Hope your uh, 2021 goes well. I hope your 2021 is fantastic, and I hope that we get to do something down the line soon. Yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. All right, man. Have a great evening. 
Stay safe out there. I, I'm curious to see what the snow looks like. I haven't seen it yet, but. No, dude, the snow, I'm looking at it right now. It's beautiful. Okay. It's fantastic. It's covered the ground completely. It's it's great. You right. should go outside. After I'm, a, I'm about to head out right now, so All I'm right. looking forward to it. Okay. All well, right, man. I'm going to keep you. Peace. See you around. Peace out.